Welcome to the MMA Roadshow, episode number 14. And uh, listen, if you're a close follower of the MMA Roadshow, especially our Instagram, the MMA Roadshow, you may well very know that I am in San Luis Potosi, Mexico. I'm actually on vacation right now. Meanwhile, Cold Coffee is back home in Las Vegas. But guess what? That's not going to stop us from doing a podcast. Cold Coffee, how you doing, brother? I'm doing good, man. Poto- uh, how do you say it? Po- Potosi? San Luis Potosi. It was, uh, I've learned a lot about this town. Uh, it's actually where my, I'm down here because my wife's parents live here. We brought the kid, and uh, we're hanging out for a little bit, spending a little family time. I learned a lot. This, this town was established in 1592 uh, when the Spanish found gold and silver here. And uh, the Potosi came, came from uh, a town in Bolivia by the same name that also had gold uh, reserves. And explorers thought it reminded them of that. So there's your history lesson for the week on San Luis Potosi. I love it. No, I've, I've been uh, digging the pictures, man. It, uh, I love the old architecture and stuff. That's a lot of the stuff that, you know, I think we miss here in a lot of the places in, in the States. You know, you miss those cool old buildings. You know, we're quick to uh, demolish something, to put something new and uh, shiny up. And I think we miss the opportunities when uh, you go to places that have that history. So, no, I'm appreciating the videos. I'm glad you're having a good time. Uh, I dug the uh, the three-wheeler, Eli, uh, doing his <laughs> thing at the the shopping mall or whatever. That was that was pretty cool. Yeah, man, we've had a little bit of fun. We've had a little bit of fun. So, uh, you know, it's it's a little bit of rest and relaxation before International Fight Week, which is going to be absolutely insane. So trying to enjoy a little bit of that. So that's kind of what this week is all about. But we still wanted to have a road show, man, because uh, we're having fun doing this thing, man. I think we love talking about MMA. So uh, it's my understanding, though, that you are not keeping with road show tradition. I am sitting here with a nice ice cold Corona, uh, doing it like you're supposed to do in Mexico with the Corona right here in front of me as we tape this podcast. You, on the other hand, I believe are drinking a green drink. It is. It's a green juice. You know, I mean, one, uh, you're, you're central time or whatever. You're two hours ahead of me, you know, so you're a little more into your day. Me, I, you know, I'm trying to, trying to be a little healthier at times. And so earlier I did my little uh, what's become a, a daily routine. I've walked a few miles earlier. And then I was like, hey, you know, I went and went to the store and made this little green drink, you know, some kale, some Dana, some strawberries, you know, trying to, trying to augment it every once in a while. And, you know... That's my excuse, trying to be healthy, but uh, to be also uh, honest and fair, I, I only had a Bud Light, one Bud Light in the fridge, and <laughs> I wasn't ready to go there. You know, I thought I, I thought I had an extra PBR stash somewhere, but I think I already got to it the other day. So, Would you throw, like, some vodka in your green drink or something? Oh, man, I probably could. I do have, like, a, I got some JMO and some Fireball in the fridge, but I probably, <laughs> I don't know if, I don't know if I'm, I'm that hardcore. You Dude, know, I I'll, mean, if I'll, the I'll, drink is green, what goes better than Irish whiskey in a green drink? You know, <laughs> maybe, maybe maybe for the next one. <laughs> Good idea. Good suggestion. All right, Good man. Suggestion. Well, it, let's, let's, let's get into the big news. I mean, there's a lot going on, and we're going to talk about it since we last taped. But obviously, of course, speaking of uh, Irish, uh, you know, the, the big news, of course, that we've been following all week is Chad Mendes is now facing Conor McGregor. Jose Aldo is no longer competing. And, of course, that's been the, the dominant news all week long, and we're breaking anything there. Um I guess I just want to get your thoughts. I mean, obviously, we spent a lot of time with Conor McGregor right before we taped the last episode. Uh, we knew this was a possibility, but it seemed like the UFC was trying to do everything in their power to keep this fight together, um, and now it, it's not. And, you know, I'm in Mexico, so it's kind of tough for me to get a judge. I'm, I'm, I'm following online. Um, you're, you're in Las Vegas, so maybe you can tell me a little bit more, but... You know, how does this affect the buzz around the fight? Because I'm still, I mean, I'm still hyped about the fight, man. I think, you know, Chad Mendes versus Conor McGregor um, is a fight that I wanted to see at some point anyway. But it's not the fight that we've been building up to for what seems like this entire year. And as, you know, we put out the other day, I mean, we still had videos teed up, ready to go. A video that you were working on. I mean, gosh, we were so close to this fight happening. And now it fell apart. So what's your take on the whole thing? And what are you feeling on the ground there in Las Vegas? Yeah, and definitely uh, just to, to start on the video part, uh, you know, I was so bummed, you know. Yeah, I love it when you work on stuff and you get things, you know, all lined up and ready to go and you get excited and you're like, oh, yeah, I think people are going to really get into this. And then, of course, the fight drops out. And it was especially after so much of they're like, oh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's not broken. It's not this, 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 you know. You know, that was a big letdown. And I think, you know, honestly, to, to see these guys really want to fight each other made me so excited to watch that mm-hmm. fight. You know, outside of just having two, <coughs> excuse me, very high level 
guys ready to go at it. They really wanted to get in there and throw down. And I think to see guys that excited to fight just makes me that much more excited to want to watch it. Um, but again, you know, when we were talking initially about whether, you know, when Jose thought it was, was broken and was still thinking about going in, I was very <coughs> against the idea and sort of thought like he should pull out and just pull out then. But then they come back and say bruise. But then, what was it, yesterday or the day before, Ana Luisa posts pictures, x-rays, and you can clearly see, or what looks to me, I mean, granted, I'm no doctor, um, a fracture along one of the bottom ribs. I don't know if you've seen the x-rays. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> but when, when you go and you see that, it's like, how was there ever any doubt that it was a broken rib and not a bruise? Was somebody pressured to say, hey, it's bruised? Instead of broken, and and did finally somebody say, "Hey, enough's enough. I realize this is wrong. I can't do this. I'm not 100 percent because one, I don't want to see a not 100 percent um, Jose Aldo go in there, and also, you know, <coughs> conversely to that, Chad Mendez. I'm so excited to see him fight, but as well, and we kind of mentioned this last week, full fight camp Chad is a lot different than two week Chad. You know, I know that he's he's tough and he's fit and he's going to be in there and he's ready to go. Um, I just, you know, two weeks out going, I mean, I just don't think he's going to be fully prepared to where he needs to be for Chad. I mean, I'm sorry, for Connor. Do I think he still could beat him? Yes. Do I think he has a lot more daunting task ahead of him now? For sure. Uh, but, I mean, I am total a fan of Team Alpha Male and the way those guys work and the way Chad works, you know, a big fan of him. I think he is an outstanding gentleman and uh, one heck of a fighter. So I'm very, very excited to see that. You know, will I cry if Connor loses? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but, you know, again, I think the UFC's put so much damn money into this. They were pushing and pulling for the fight to actually happen. And I feel bad for my, my old uh, coworkers and buddies that back there were toiling away working for the whole Aldo and McGregor fight and then to have that drop and then immediately start have to recreate um, promos and yeah. everything to put stuff, you know, even though, you know, you see some people online, oh, just Photoshop Chad's head over top of Aldo and, you know, just sub a word here and there and, you know, there you go, you know, like, you know, and, and what was it yesterday? I think I was watching, uh, it was like the Women's World Cup. And they had already made the decision that the Mendez was fighting. But guess what promo came onto the TV? <laughs> there goes the Mendez. Oh, I'm sorry, the Aldo and McGregor one. You know, I'm, well, I'm thinking like, hey, that's a cool promo. That's totally outdated, you know. And it's like now it's just like, you know, pouring salt on the wound. It's just like, oh, shit. Well, that's not happened. That was, would have been a really cool fight. But, you know, all in all, I think it's still uh, a very good fight. I mean, I think... People are excited to see it. I think this is the fight that a lot of people are like, hey, you know, there goes there goes their prize, man, because they put Mendez in there. But, hey, you know, I think that also, you know, that's full fight camp, Chad, that people are talking about. You know, I mean, whether, you know, the difference of eight weeks or, you know, nine weeks, however long these guys put in typically as compared to two weeks, you know, um, maybe the main difference is cardio. It's not like I don't think he's going to learn any particular new moves, you know, going into that. But definitely, I think just preparing on getting the mindset right there. I think two weeks. I mean, I mean, these guys are top level guys, but that's got to be a lot to immediately wrap yourself around a title match in two weeks time against a guy that's coming in with so much hype as Conor McGregor. Um, but hey, I'm excited to watch it. I'll I'll be there front row watching that shit so yeah no doubt well two quick points i want to make and first is that it was anahisa that actually tweeted the the mm. report you said anahisa. Ana Luisa, which means you were thinking of Ana Luisa garcia who used to work for the ufc's pr company down in brazil so i'll be sure to yeah. pass that news on <laughs> <laughs> and secondly anahisa, yes it's and, and secondly you also don't cough nearly as much when you're drinking beer you <laughs> i know it so. what is this it's the green shit I'll it's tell the you, kale you i should have stuck with the beer but you know i'm, I'm with you Here, here's the deal uh, certainly i'm just Point. It's funny you talk about rubbing salt in the wound. I mean, on Sunday, um, I've got to imagine they've, you know, Fox is still going to air that Bad Blood promo that uh, they spent, you know, time and money making. I saw a preview of it. It's a really good preview of uh, Aldo versus McGregor. Of course, it's not going to happen anymore. I've got to think that Fox is still going to air that. So, again, that's going to be, you know, more promos that are wasted. But I, I'm disappointed. I think like anybody, I wanted to see the fight. But I really do feel like this is the right call. I mean, 
I just, with all that's in this fight, whenever it does happen, if it happens, I, I don't think you'd want questions around it. And this rib, you know, injury would certainly throw, you know, huge questions in anything. I mean, if Aldo goes out there and, and, and would have destroyed Conor McGregor, now he's an absolute legend. You know, now he's an absolute legend. But anything less than that, now you've kind of got a built-in excuse. So I don't think anybody wants any question marks. You know, how would Aldo have performed any differently? I'm sure Conor McGregor wouldn't even want any question marks. You know, if he beats Jose Aldo to say, well, you know, you didn't beat him because uh, you're better. You just beat him because of this rib issue. So I'm sure he's kind of happy that that's not there. Um, I will say that, you know, we're going to have Dana White available to us next week on Thursday at the press conference. We did get the official fight week schedule for UFC 189 and the Tough 21 finale in Las Vegas. We're going to have Dana there. And listen, we're going to have to ask him, what happened here? How was there this big of a difference between doctors in Brazil saying, you know, that this thing is broken and doctors in the U.S. apparently saying, no, it's bruised, he's going to fight, he's going to carry on. And, you know, it kind of goes back to the original question that you and I talked about last week, I believe, which is, why did all this information come out ahead of time? You know, why in a team like Novo and Yao did this information come out? A team that's normally very tight in a fight that's as big as it is. Um, you know, was it, you know, I, I had wondered, hey, were they, you know, were they trying to get more money? Were they trying to get into McGregor's head? What was it? Maybe it was just the fact that they were kind of worried the UFC was going to force their hand if they didn't get out ahead of the UFC and announce to the world that he had a broken rib. That's a good point. So that's a good point. Yeah, and and again, I mean that's all speculation on my point. I don't think we'll ne ever necessarily know the truth, but we're, we're, you know we're definitely gonna have to ask Dana about it and find out what the timeline was. You know why he could think this rib wasn't broken if it actually was. And I man, I get it, man. I, I'm I'm sure they were trying to be as positive as they possibly could. I mean, as much money as they dropped into this thing, um, you know, I totally get the fact that they would they want this fight to happen. And and maybe that had something to do. You know, they were kind of uh, what's the old expression? Looking at everything through through rose tinted glasses or whatever. You know, trying to have the best outlook possible. But um, I don't think this is a bad situation. I think certainly as far as the promotion goes, it's it's kind of rough. I think the fight is good. You you bring up some great points. I mean, I've always said I think Chad Mendez would beat Conor McGregor. I've always said that. And now it's coming time to make my pick. And I never meant that I thought, Conor, you know, Chad Mendez could step in on 10 days notice or whatever and beat Conor McGregor. Um, it's a little bit different situation now. So, you know, can I stick by my guns and say that it's a bad matchup? I mean, um, Chad certainly he keeps himself in shape. He's, you know, he's always training. So I don't think he's like completely out of fight shape. But um, it, it's it's very, very tough. Are, 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 do you uh, do you have a pick? Do you know which way you're leaning? Because i got to be honest, right now I'm, I'm, I'm still on the fence. You know, I, if you would have asked me beforehand, I would have said uh, Chad like 100%. And even right now, um, I am I am leaning towards Chad. But even when you say that when these guys say, hey, yeah, I'm always working. I'm always in the gym. I'm always whatever. And I believe that and I know they work hard. But when guys are in fight camp and they have that fight in head, there's something about when, I, when you watch them, you know. And granted, I haven't done it myself. You know, I just... From looking through my camera and looking at these guys' faces for all these years, you see something that, you know, you're just like, all right, yeah, this guy's primed and ready to go. Now, granted, has it been like that when he's just going to the gym and just working out just to stay in shape and do kind of things? I mean, I think there's definitely a difference in the, the mindset of what he's been doing and will that affect how ready he really is? It really could. But, you know, and, and all things too, and I, I don't know – what I was thinking, but you know, even when we did the Conor McGregor to go over to Conor's side, when we worked, did that open workout, you know, and watched him, I thought he looked good. But even then, I'm like, he looks kind of tired. You know, I don't know if it's all these hoops and all these things that they're making him have to do. That maybe, maybe the show, the show puppy is getting is getting tired. You know, maybe that was just that day. You know, granted, I don't follow him around like all these other people. So then I start wondering, you know, well, maybe maybe we're not seeing 100% Connor either. So maybe two-week Chad and maybe not 100% uh, McGregor can make for a great fight. And, and who knows? I mean, I think, I think if Chad gets him with a couple of those good solid shots and if he can work the wrestling and get him down, I'm definitely leaning towards Chad. If Connor's able to keep his distance and do some of the things I saw him do in that practice where the, the the his wrestling partner was unable to get in there and get hands on him, I think Connor's going to pull it out and it 
might go a little bit longer than the, the first round that he said and maybe a little bit longer than the three rounds that Chad said. And if and if Chad can't get in there and get that wrestling, then I got to lean towards Connor. But if Chad's able to get in there, get some wrestling, but also establish his hands so that Connor starts getting worried about that, which opens up the wrestling, then I'm going to lean towards Chad. I know that's not really a pick, but I guess I kind of want – maybe I, I want almost want to see him f- – fight week i want yeah. to see him on the way in and that's usually when we all finally make that final thing i know you guys <laughs> you make your picks at the beginning of the week that's kind of always been me is when i see that final stare down see how good they look how fresh they look and i think you know uh, speaking of that chad without having to really kill himself you know as for like a full fight camp and he's coming in refreshing and he's just really going to hit it you know say these 10 days out he might be coming in super fresh where you know, some people um, were questioning whether Connor, there was an issue maybe with a knee, maybe something else was going on. Um, so who knows? You know, I mean, it could it could be something. But until I see him on that scale, I, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of like you. I'm kind of a little bit on the fence. But uh, you know, if, if it would have been a full fight camp, I would said 100. percent I think Chad. Yeah. But you know. I, I know that's not a good answer, but definitely definitely on the fence as it's, well. And it's it's the fair answer right now. It's funny. We do make our staff picks at the beginning of the week, and I kind of wish we didn't. I, 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 there's lots of times. Uh, Yo Romero, Loretta Machida being a prime example where, where my opinion really starts to change for the week, and, and I hate going in there and changing my picks just because – I don't know. I hate, I hate putting extra work on somebody, number one. And number two, I feel like maybe I'm just jinxing myself by getting there and, and, and messing with something and overthinking things instead of going with my original gut. But, you know, you brought up a really good point. You know, I don't know if you saw the actual ESPN interview where Dana and Connor broke the news that it was going to be Chad and not Aldo, but – uh, Connor just had kind of this weird look on his face. Uh, definitely not the intensity that we're used to seeing. And, and um, definitely, I think – some frustration or whatever, but looked a little tired as well. And then I started thinking too. I mean, man, they've got they've got Connor flying out for this uh, this Reebok unveil. Uh, you know, he's taping uh, taping Conan O'Brien. Um, you know, doing uh, additional media, and, and I get it, man. He's their superstar right now. I mean, I think I think Ronda Rousey's the biggest star in the UFC right now, but I think Connor's probably second. Um, and, you know, and certainly in, in certain markets, uh, Ireland, for instance. I mean, he's he's number one, no doubt. So, um, you know, maybe things are starting to wear down. I mean, we know this guy is committed to physical fitness. We know that he's committed to having, um, you know, control of his body, control of his muscles, and being in the best physical uh, shape possible. But you just never, you you just never know so uh man it's gonna be interesting to see I, a couple last notes for me on this um obviously it's it's you know it's been a huge point of discussion all week i do think it's interesting that uh, not interesting i mean it was obviously very predictable but um i do think it's intriguing nonetheless that this fight does stay the main event despite the fact that it's for an interim title belt now and you have the actual welterweight championship as the co-main event you know it's uh yeah. I, I i think it's understandable i mean it's not like we need to sit here and debate it we get it i mean robbie lawler and rory mcdonald god bless them they're great fighters they are not going to generate the types of pay-per-view buys that conor mcgregor is no matter who he's fighting i don't even think you know honestly i don't even think there has to be an interim belt on the line i think if it was just conor mcgregor versus chad mendez for no belt you know a number one contender fight i think you still leave it as as the main event just because they're the ones that are going to be getting people to tune in so but i, I do think it's just kind of a, a unique observation because it's not the way yeah. the UFC has done business in the past. And, and the other thing about this is um, I got to say, man, you know, no matter what happens here, Conor McGregor versus Jose Aldo is still a fight I want to see. Um, you know, even if Chad wins the interim title, you know, if Chad wins the interim title, obviously you got to do Mendez and Aldo for the unified belt next. Um, you know, Frankie Edgar's in there somewhere. So I don't know when the fight would happen, how it would happen, uh, unless Conor wins, of course. Um, but it's still a fight that, that I want to see at some point. I agree. And and just to, to finish the point when you said about uh, the, uh, the the interim fight is, is taking center stage over the actual title fight, you know, it kind of just made me think initially of when I took that trip to Bellator and they put the Kimbo Slice fight as mm-hmm. the main event ahead of the main event, or the I'm sorry, the uh, title defense. And the fighter was a little bit, you know, peeved you know he felt that the organization kind of did him a little bit wrong you know and but he understood and i think it's the same case in this you know he knew what was going to bring the numbers and what's going to be bringing the eyeballs to this event i don't think 
uh, Robbie Lawler or Roy McDonald's going to argue that point by any chance. And what's also what's unique about these particular two individuals is I don't think either one really is that upset or going to get that upset. Both of them, I think, are company guys. They realize what's going on. You know, they'd much rather have guys pushing the numbers up higher, you know, to get more people watching. And they probably think and it's relieving the pressure a little bit for their match mm -hmm. because everybody's going to be watching the other one. So I'm sure they're not really mad. But it just stuck in my head when I immediately thought that. I was like, wow, this is the same thing at Bellator that really kind of made the fighter feel like, okay, I'm your champion, but this is this is what you want to do. But you're, <laughs> you know, but you're right. Even if this wasn't an interim belt, I think more people would probably – uh, interested to see this fight just for the fact that Connor is such a, a galvanizing individual. You either love him or you hate him, or you just want to see him smash somebody and back up what he says, or you kind of want to see him get smashed to shut his mouth up. You know, I mean, either way, you want to watch. You know, and uh, kudos him to him for for doing that. I mean, he's brought something to the sport that uh, very few have ever been able to do, and. Um, you know, I'm, and I'm glad you. I, I thought I agree with the whole thing where I think he he did look a little bit tired, and I wonder if now because I know Rhonda was out there for the the Reebok thing, but they, it feels like she's kind of maybe even just said, "Hey guys, I got other things going on. I can't do everything that you want me to do." And they've, and I think the UFC's kind of laid off of her a little bit. Whereas I don't know if Connor needs to either maybe push back a little bit, or but I'm sure he loves the attention. I mean, who yeah. wouldn't love going and doing? Conan and Brian, and then going here, and then going here. He likes that. Uh, I'm in your face. I'm big time. I'm rolling. I'm whatever. I got a seven bedroom house out here in Vegas. You know, <laughs> blah blah blah. You know, I mean, who wouldn't love that? But I mean, it'll come with it, time. I think it'll come with time. I mean, I remember when Ronda was literally everywhere before her Liz Carmouche fight, and I remember you know Dana saying at the press conference, "This is the most media anybody has ever done," you know, including Brock Lesnar, and it was true. I mean, she was on top of everything, and now. You know, she's still everywhere, but she does a very good job of compartmentalizing everything. You know, hey, I'm going to shoot movies from this date to that date. You know, I'll be available for media and load me up for media for this day to this. You know, she, she does a really good job of sectioning off everything, and I think that's something that get, Connor is going to have to get good at. You know, not to say that he hasn't. May, maybe he's handling everything perfectly and in stride, um, but it does seem like, you know, he's everywhere, and, and we'll see if that affects his performance or not. For sure. Well, uh, the last thing, uh, I guess, uh, what I want to do here is um, uh, play you the UFC 189 conference call highlights. There was about a 45-minute call um, that featured Chad Mendes, Conor McGregor, Robbie Lawler, and Rory McDonald. And I know not everybody jumps on these things, but there were some great quotes in there. And, you know, there's stories that come out. Um, which which kind of encapsulate the quotes a little bit. But what I thought would be fun to do, since I am on vacation down here in Mexico this week, I wasn't able to do a ton of interviews, um, I, I thought it would be kind of fun to just boil this thing down. I, I boil this 45-minute phone call down to 15 minutes or so of just the top stuff there. And, and uh, no offense to Robbie Lawler or Rory McDonald. Uh, <laughs> I left their questions and answers out. I didn't think that's anything anybody really wanted to hear. Um, but I edited down this phone call into what I think is um, – you know, a fun little highlight package that if you haven't gotten to hear the whole thing, you at least get to hear a little bit of that now. So uh, we're going to uh, – I'm going to go get myself another ice-cold Corona out of the refrigerator. Maybe cold coffee is going to go blend up some fruits and vegetables. Maybe he'll <laughs> maybe he'll go grab that one lonely Bud Light and give it some company. Or maybe maybe he'll open that Fireball or that JMO. I guess we'll just have to uh, – we'll have to go to break and we'll have to, to listen to this conference call highlight and then uh, and then we'll find out. This is the UFC 189 media conference call, UFC 189, next Saturday night. Chad Mendez versus Conor McGregor for the interim featherweight title and Robbie Lawler versus Roy McDonald for the featherweight, uh, excuse me, for the welterweight title. All four participants are on the call. And, John, without further ado, let's go ahead and go to the first question. And we'll take our first question from Ron Crook with Inside MMA. Hey guys, thanks for the time today. I'd like to begin with a question to Connor McGregor. Uh, Connor, you are going from preparing for Jose Aldo, a Muay Thai and stand up fighter, to facing a very strong wrestler in Chad Mendez. Did you have to completely blow up your strategy and game plan? Give us a little insight on that. I'm, uh, I don't have a game plan. I just go in there formless, rootless, cold. 
and that's it. It does not matter who who was in front of me or what style or what approach they have. My approach will win the fight. Connor, a quick follow-up. Was there any thought of not accepting this fight with Chad Mendez, or was that, uh, and if the answer is no, why not? Uh, not, not, not one uh, thought. The, the approach for me was I came in and I told them that I was going to destroy everyone in the division. One by one, I would get every single one of them. I said that time and time again. It, does not, it was never about the champion. It was never about any of that. It was about me destroying every single one of these featherweights and essentially making it a one-man uh, division. So it doesn't matter what way it happens, whether it's Jose Force, Chad Force, they're all going to get it. Every single one of them are going to get it. Very good. Thank you. Final question just to Chad Mendez. Chad, uh, once it was official that Aldo was out, how long of a training camp will you have had preparing for Conor McGregor? I've been preparing for Conor McGregor since the first time I've seen this dude fight in the UFC. This is a guy that I knew was, uh, you know, he's going to talk his way up to the top. You know, he'd be every person they put in front of him. Uh, you know, this is time for me to get in there and do, you know, what I've trained for my entire life and that's become the champion. You know, I, I live a healthy lifestyle. I stay in great shape year-round. Um, I never let my weight get too far out of control. And, uh, you know, for me, taking anything on, you know, three weeks, this is this is perfect for me, especially fighting a guy like Connor. You know, this is a guy that you know, I know I can beat, and I'm going to get in there and I'm going to do that. We'll take our next question from Damon Martin with Fox Sports. Uh, yeah, first question is for Connor. Uh, you know, Connor, yesterday we saw the news with uh, Jose Aldo, you know, come out kind of suddenly. But in your own head, had you already thought that, that Aldo was going to drop out of the fight? Is that something you had contemplated since you heard about the rib injury? Um, I've been contemplating it since long before the rib injury. Long before. As soon as the fight was announced, I've been contemplating it. I knew, like I said before, the eyes never lie. And any time I looked into that man's eyes, I saw fear. I saw glass. So I anticipated he would not show up. And when he got his opportunity to pull, he pulled. So it's something I expected. But I, Is there... really, I, don't, I don't blame the man. I was going to fucking butcher him. Rip him limb from limb. So I probably wouldn't want to face that either. So it is what it is. With, with, with that said, you know, you uh, you mentioned earlier that, you know, it was never about Aldo. It was about, you know, the title and about obviously, you know, beating every featherweight out there. But is there some part of you that feels like there is a score to be settled with Aldo when he comes back? 100%. If he, if he mans up. We should we should most certainly get it on, but I don't know whether he will be back. Like I said, he's gone running, and I don't think he'll be back. Now we'll take our next question from Aiden O'Donoghue with Irish Sun newspaper. Uh, hi there, I have a question for Connor. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> sorry, Connor, <clears throat> you've had a longer training camp than Chad has. But from his point of view, um, this came along was unexpected, and he's happy to have this fight. So do you think your longer training camp is going to benefit you or maybe he's going to have a shot in the arm from getting this opportunity? Um, no, I, I have been in fight camp since I'm eight years of age. I am prepared for this. I've been preparing for this moment for a long, long time. and I don't really pay attention to how long he has or how long he hasn't had. Um, I just look at his past performance and I feel he, I feel he is... He he is a he's in the wrong weight division. I feel. I feel he gasses too quick. Uh, that's what I see happen. I see exchanges early. I see him gasping for breath, and I see me butchering his facial structure after that until I I take the victory. Okay, thanks, Connor. And uh, one question for Chad. Chad, uh, you previously described yourself as the Mike Tyson of the division with a mean black double leg. How do you think your striking is going to compare with Connor's? I think my striking is going to be great. Connor's never faced anyone like me before. I have the athleticism, the strength, the power, the speed, and I have wrestling to put him on his back and finish this fight. This is a fight that this fight is mine. And we'll take our next question from Brett Okamoto with ESPN. 
Thanks for the time, guys. A uh, couple questions for you, Chad. Obviously, this was a big opportunity. It wasn't one that you were going to turn down. What is the biggest challenge, though, about uh, going into a five-round, you know, big title fight in Las Vegas, headlining a card on just two weeks' notice? Is it trying to get timing? Is it trying to get your cardio up? Is it cutting the weight? I mean, what would you say is the single most difficult part about it? I mean, I wouldn't pick out one single difficult thing. I mean, everything, you know, pretty much right on track where it would be if I just went through a full training camp. You know, I don't, I don't stop training. I don't just go through a camp fight and then, you know, completely leave the gym and never see it again and camp again. You know, this is a, a training year round. This is our job. This is what we're, you know, made to do. This is what we're doing for our good, uh, and I love doing it. So. You know, I felt ready. I've been training. I've been hitting it hard. You know, I got the call. We're three weeks out. You know, at that point, it's just fine-tuning, getting that weight down. And I, I said before, I don't get too far away from my weight, uh, my fight weight, you know, 15, 20 pounds at max, you know. And, uh, you know, it, it for me, it when you get a call like that, you jump all over it, uh, you know, and I'll be ready. And I've seen in some previous interviews you've done that you're not going to go into this fight emotional, but you have said that some of the he has said has made it personal for you, and I wondered if you could expand on that. I mean, we know he's called you short, but you don't seem like the kind of guy who would really take that to heart. What is what has he said exactly that, that has rubbed you the wrong way? I mean, yeah, the short shit, I mean, I don't really give a shit about that kind of stuff. I've been short my whole life. But, uh, you know, for me it was we had to do an interview right before uh, my Aldo fight, and he's talking about putting balls on, on my head and, you know, just being very unprofessional. And, uh, you know, this is something that, you know, I made it personal. And uh, for me, you, know, you don't fucking do that. You know, this is a, a fight game. This is something where somebody could see. And that's what I'm looking to do when I get in there against Conor McGregor. And my last question, I, I you were probably assuming that he was going to make some kind of prediction on the fight. That's what he's been doing, you know, really throughout his, his UFC career. He said that you're going to finish, he's going to finish you in four minutes. And I guess I would just ask you, what do you think is going to be happening in the fight four minutes in? Yeah, Connor, I'm going to give you a little more respect, buddy. I'm going to finish you within the first three. And we'll take a question from Jack in Casino. Connor, do you think Chad is a tougher fight than Jose? I think Chad is the substitute, the B level. I think he's a wrestler with an overhand that gasses. You know what I mean? I think his body, his body weight to his so to his height and you know his body is in disproportion and I think that hampers him as a fighter I think that's why he gasses and he gets that he gets that tiredness and that's why when I'm pressing him I'm pressing him and we have these exchanges and these scrambles and his belly is going to be and his body is going to be screaming and I'm going to be still there in his face cracking him with everything I have every shot the heel the knee the elbow the fist every shot in the book I have and, and and that will be that. Eventually, he will give like like they all do. Thanks. I don't know how you're going to be pressuring anything from your back. Too. So listen, what 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 you going to do? You can't e- you can't even pass guard. You're a white belt on the mat. What you get me down? You hold me down. I'll butcher you from the bottom. I'll get back up <laughs> and I'll butcher you on the feet. All right. What's what you get to? What are you going to do? Are you going to do the splits on me? Oh, Fucking. No, what do you think you're John Van Dam here? I'm going to kick you in the throat. <laughs> All right, dude. You're so tough. So tough. We'll see. Thanks, guys. And we'll take our next question from guest Ryan with Independence IE. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. Thanks for your time. Uh, first question just to Connor. Uh, a lot of the social media posts, not a lot, but some of the social media posts uh, that have come out from your camp recently have showed you working on your wrestling. Um, what... Plus, have, how good is your wrestling compared to uh, some of the U.S. fighters who have you do it, do it in college and, and, and in high school? I, I am very confident that if we exchange in any grappling sequence, I have, the, I have the ability to dominate him. I have my wrestling coach out here, and he has been with me my whole career since I'm 15 years of age. I have been training with, with Sergey. Um, so he has been with me this whole camp, not just... Not just because the the opponent change has been Chad. He has been out here since we have arrived in Las Vegas. So my whole team is out here. My team since day one. My team that have been with me from the beginning are all out here. My wrestling coaches, my stand up coaches, my sparring partners, my jiu jitsu coaches. My whole team. 
And we'll take our next question from Stephen Morocco with USA Today. Hey, Connor. Um, uh, there's been a rumor going around on Twitter that you are undergoing PRP therapy for your knee. Is that accurate? What, what is PRP? I believe it's stem cell therapy, or it could be platelet-rich plasma. Uh, there's, a, there's a variety of different uh, uh, treatments that go to, uh, to rejuvenating the no. knee. No. My no? buddy is good. My buddy is good. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And we'll take our next question from Ariel Hilwani with MMAfighting.com. Hey guys, thanks for the time. Um, first, just wanted to ask Chad a quick question. I know prior to the second Aldo fight, it got a little heated between you two. But would you say that you've never felt this way about an opponent, that it's never been this personal for you before a fight? <laughs> you would go there, huh, Ariel? You love staring up shit, bro. <laughs> uh, no, man, this is, yeah, this is a fight that I'm fucking super pumped to get in there and do, man. Like I said, two weeks notice, or a day notice where I have a full fucking camp. I'm not turning this fight down. Okay, and uh, for Connor, I know that uh, you've never actually faced off with Chad. You've never actually looked in his eyes. But when you hear that, he says that, you know, he, he was uh, annoyed and disrespected by your comments on that uh, that UT sports show, which was, you know, almost a year ago. Do you, do you think that you're in his head? Do you think that this is a man that's, you know, treating this fight too personally, that's too emotional about it? Um, I don't really, I don't really care about that. You know, we're too close to the fight. None of this, it doesn't really matter. But I can hear a quiver in his, in his voice there. I feel, I feel when it comes down to it and the shots are exchanged, he, he, I see him more as an athlete than a fighter. So, I feel he will break in there. It doesn't matter whether the build up has happened or not. We will get in there and he will break. Nope. We'll take our next question from Lee and Ducey with Fairfax Media. A uh, question for Connor. Connor, Chad has, I guess, questioned your mental fortitude. Uh, you said that you have quit in you referencing your last submission loss in 2010. I mean, do you write those sort of comments considering that you've come a long way in the last five years? Um, no, I do not. I do not rate them. I know my growth. I know my work ethic, and I know where I have come in this game. And now I am in a p position where I am invincible. Thanks. And also, just with regards, I mean, you're fighting for the interim belt. In a way, this might give more ammo to the people, I guess, that don't like you out there. They will say that, okay, fine, you're the interim champ, but... You've just beaten a guy with no distress. They, they'll, they'll always say twice. something. Let me tell you, because you sound like one of them people. They'll always say something to try and discredit what I'm doing here. There's always going to be a question. The, the, the ref, you know, every every fight there's a question. You know, now now it's the wrestler question, you know, but no matter what happens, and now, now you're talking, there's going to be the interim question. Then when I smoke chat, he's only had two weeks, and... There'll always be something to try and discredit me, but at the end of the day, cash beats credit every day of the week, and that's what I'm here for. I'm here to shut this man down, break that pay-per-view record, and cash them big, fat checks, and fuck everybody that's down me. And we'll take our next question from James and Kabia with Zoo Magazine. Thank you. Um, just a question for you, Chad. Um, how important is it for you to be um, the first man to shut Conor McGregor's mouth in the UFC? This is huge, man. This is, like I said, this is a fight I don't turn down. Uh, you know, I got the offer, and I said, give me that contract right away. So, uh, you know, this is a huge, huge opportunity. I'm not turning it. Welcome back to the MMA Roadshow. That was Conor McGregor and Chad Mendez giving some of their best trash talk. Of course, Conor is obviously a little bit better at that in most senses, but Chad Mendez, I think, defended himself pretty well stepping in on short notice. Uh, again, my name is John Morgan. I'm in San Luis Potosi, Mexico this week. I'm on vacation. Uh, my man Cold Coffee is back in Vegas. Now, before we left, Cold Coffee had a very important decision to make <laughs> because typically we like to have these shows over a few frosty beverages, uh, but... 
because it's a little bit earlier in the day and because uh, I am not with cold coffee to be a horrible influence, uh, he was trying to be a little bit healthy and, and get a green drink. But it was time to re-up. And uh, cold coffee, I just got to know, what uh, what choice did you make on, on beverage? You know, I, I was torn. I, I thought I could maybe cut to the chase and take a little shots of this, a shot of that. But, you know, I, I, re- I reached inside the fridge, and, and I'll share it with you now. I'll, I'll give you a little... Nice. Can, yeah, yeah. Look at this. This is this was left over from a, a barbecue I had, I think, a couple weeks ago. It's a nice, refreshing, tall boy Bud Light. And what's interesting? It's twenty five fluid ounces. It's not twenty four like everybody else does. Like my favorite PBR, they just had to try to one up them. So one uh, extra. That's how they do. There you go. I guess Bud Light. Well done on the the extra ounce. You know, and uh, I'd be glad to plug your beer some more should you decide to uh, <laughs> sponsor the <laughs> MMA Roadshow. But if my uh, PBR would want to counter their offer, that would be even better. But so, yeah, no, I figured. I figured, in all in all fairness, you know, it's not the MMA Roadshow for not drinking beer. So you're damn you know, so, right. You're damn so right. So here's that. <laughs> well, let's talk about it. after uh, we talked about the big news. Of course, there's some other news and some things I want to talk about. Um, Last week was your birthday, of course. I've snuck in a little bit of vacation, so we've kind of been – we didn't do a lot of traveling is what I'm saying. We didn't go to UFC Fight Night 70. We didn't go down to Florida. That was, of course, the card that got absolutely decimated by the visa problems. Um, I was originally supposed to go to that card when it was in Brazil. When it moved to Florida, um, I decided to let Matt Erickson handle that, and I would take an extra week off at home. Uh, it did become kind of a, a crazy uh, – clown show i guess going into it where 12 people were forced off of it um that's something it's crazy i I did do something pretty cool over the weekend though i did call fights uh with world series of fighting fighter danny d1 davis a las vegas guy at the thomas and max center tough enough of course uh most people that listen to the show will be aware of tough enough the premier amateur organization in the nation no question about it i've been calling fights for them for a long time uh really a fan of what they do out there a lot of people have come through the tough enough ranks uh including ronda rousey who we were talking about earlier uh who had the opportunity to call a few of her fights which are now uh, on usc fight pass which is pretty cool but um this past weekend they did a show at thomas and max center it was a a, a um a free show. Anybody could come in that yeah. wanted to come in. And it was a fundraiser and uh, an awareness raiser for um, basically suicide prevention, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Um, so they partnered with a very worthwhile cause there. But uh, don't know if you saw this or not, Kokai, but drew over 16,000 people to the Thomas and Wow, Center. that's crazy. Very I love cool. Tough Enough. I think that is a great organization. And I and I, I love that they do the free shows every once in a while because, I mean, I – Thomas and Mac, what a what a neat place to to put it on and then to fill it up. I'm sure that I'm sure that was quite a sight to see. And I'm uh, no, I'm sad. I, I'm sad I wasn't there. I uh, I bet it was fun. I mean, big fans of the ring card girls, you know, uh, <laughs> and, and the fighters as well. If, you know, or and uh, and <laughs> and Jeff that runs that uh, organization is a, a very very nice individual. Yes, he and, is. Uh, kudos to that organization i'm glad they did so well well that's wh- great it was well wh- while that fight was going on while we were calling the fights i also had my computer open was following a little bit of twitter um watched actually uh the prelims via the the magic of sling box i got to watch a little bit of the prelims um but uh, the big thing that came out that night obviously yoel romero picking up the biggest win of his career uh knocking out leota machida uh, I, I had picked leota machida coming into that fight but man everything all week long kept telling me man i think i'm making a mistake here especially with the small cage um man i i i want to lean towards you romero um and it didn't ever officially change my pick uh but you romero did pick up the biggest victory of his career but that wasn't what everybody was talking about afterwards it was um what your romero's post-fight speech entailed and this was just too big of a topic for me to pass up i know i know it happened this past weekend but i hadn't had a chance to weigh in since i've been on vacation and i really wanted to say something but i didn't want to do it on twitter i just don't think there's any way um to get your point across in social media on a topic that's potentially this big um and that is of course whether or not he said no for gay jesus um basically condemning uh, the landmark decision uh, by the United States Supreme Court to allow same-sex marriage across the United States. And I just got to say, I can't enter the mind of Yoel Romero. I've listened to it a whole lot of times. Um, I can't necessarily say what he intended to say or what he intended to mean. But in, in my in in my dealings with Yoel Romero, I just don't think there's any way in hell that he said no for gay Jesus. Um, it's well known that, that Yoel is... I mean, um, among the most religious guys you'll ever meet. 
a, he, he really is just devoutly, devoutly religious. But the other thing about Yoel is that he's also, at least in my experiences with him, one of the least likely people you'll ever meet to voice a strong opinion about anything. Uh, in doing pre-fight interviews with him and speaking with him, it's hard to get him to, I don't want to say talk trash, but you can't even get him to really say a strong word one way or the other. It's just very mm-hmm. much everything is up to God, everything is up to God, uh, I'm doing his will, that sort of thing. And I just I just honestly don't believe that that's what he had to say. Maybe the timing was unfortunate, um, but I, I just don't know. And honestly, I don't even know how aware of – of the Supreme Court decision he was. Uh, you've, I mean, you've right. been around a ton of fighters on fight week, and it, you talk about the weight cutting that goes in, the preparation uh, that comes in with being, uh, you know, part of the biggest fight of his life. How dialed in was he to American political decisions? I don't know, and I, I get it was a very, uh, you know, a hot-button political decision, one that a lot of people are very charged about one way or the other. But I, I just – I kind of even question how – wherever he was. So I, I just wanted to go out of my way and at least give my opinion, which which doesn't mean anything, but it's my opinion and I wanted to get it out there. I just don't sure. think there's any way in hell that he said there's no, you know, no for gay Jesus. Uh, and I agree. And I'm one of the people, and people will probably say, oh, you're, you're an idiot for thinking this. When I first heard it, I didn't hear anything that sounded like for gay Jesus. I thought he said, don't – no, forget Jesus. I immediately took it like Americans weren't going to church enough, like go back, you know, get to church, all that kind of stuff. His, his explanation at the end about how it was about part of the American dream, I kind of got a little lost in that, you know, and then I was thinking like, all right, you know, something's get a little lost in translation, you know, but one of the things, I, you know, the more I thought about it, he knows enough English that if he really wanted it to say and have it be about the marriage rights, why say no for gay Jesus? Why just say no for gay marriage? Right. He, he knows enough to say marriage. I think he would have said that if that's what he was meaning. I heard it as no forget Jesus. I thought he was saying like, hey, guys, get back to his church. He loves Jesus. He loves preaching. He, a lot of these fighters at times take that as their pulpit. I mean, look at, um, uh, uh, gosh, um, Mark. Um, Mark I'm forgetting. Munoz? Uh, no, the key, uh, the Kiwi. Um, oh, Mark Hunt. Mark Hunt loves to get in there, and and he's one of the guys that's like, uh, I'm using this as my platform, you know, to talk about Jesus, talk about this. I think a lot of fighters have done that, and you know, and I think that was he was he was emotional. He was trying to get. He just probably had the biggest win of his career, and I think he wanted to just be like, Hey, America, like get back to the church, get back to God, blah blah blah. But of course, you know, it came out and it sort of sounded like no for gay Jesus. But the guy would, I think, I honestly believe he would have said like no gay marriage or something. I've never heard him say anything that would ever make me think like, wow, Yoel's kind of a dick. You know, like he's always (laughs) been the nicest dude. He's, uh, he earned my respect even like when he fought for the troops at the fight for the troops. You know, he stood after it. You know, gave his little salute and was very, very respectful. And yeah. I loved him for that night. You know, so immediately when this came out, and I'm with you too, a lot of people initially went to Twitter and started kind of banging out a little bit, you know, about this and that. You know, and I was trying to keep a little more even keel and like, hey, I, I'm hoping that he's going to explain himself in the post presser. I'm hoping that, you know, what is sort of being said is not what's being said. You know, but um, yeah, I when I initially heard it, I didn't think it was any sort of gay bashing. I think he would be smarter than that. And I think he knows enough English that he would really say what he was trying to say if he was trying to say that. Um, But yeah, it it, it put a blemish on what would have been should have been one of the biggest nights of his life, you know, but, uh, you know, it's unfortunate. But I think most people have either kind of smoothed it over, you know, or kind of took his position. I'm glad the UFC kind of took their time getting the post presser and maybe said, Hey, you well, you know, you want to kind of maybe take another stab at what you were saying earlier. <laughs> um, you know, cause initially I was, you know, I was pretty much thinking like, Hey, this dude's, he's not in the running for a bonus. And at this point he's probably getting chewed out by Dana, yep. you know, but, uh, I think if anything, they had a nice talk with him afterwards, like, Hey, did you mean to say this? Or, 
And he, he could have just been like, no, like, what are you talking about? You know, <laughs> I, but, uh, I, you know, you know. I, I agree. And I think part of it may be because, again, I, I did grow up in Texas. I grew up around a lot of native Spanish speakers. My wife, I mean, I'm down here in Mexico because my wife is originally from Mexico. English is her second language. She speaks extremely fluently. Um, but we've been together almost eight years now. When we first met eight years ago, she still had a little bit of an accent. Um, she still has a little bit of an accent now. It was, it was a little more pronounced then. Um, and it, so maybe that's part of my understanding of like why I think what he said and how he said it, because I just understand the accent. Um, but beyond that, like you said, it, whether or not you're opposed to gay marriage, what does it have to do with Jesus' sexuality? I mean, you're talking right. about a religious viewpoint. So I, I just, it just doesn't think it makes sense to me. So uh, hopefully everybody's moved past it. As you said, it does seem like everybody was up in arms and kind of moved past it. Um, there wasn't a ton of media in Florida, which maybe had part of it to do as well. Everybody was stuck watching on a stream and, and nobody was actually there to follow up with questions. They were just there to spout out their opinions without actually clearing it up first. So maybe that added to it too. I, I don't know, but it does seem like everybody's kind of moving past it a little bit. Um, I guess from a fight standpoint, I guess what I want to say now is that to me, Yoel Romero versus Jacare Souza makes all the sense in the world. And I think you got to do it on the undercard of Chris Weidman versus Luke Rockhold. That's a number one contender fight for Romero and Jacare. And you've got the added benefit of if we do have one of these situations where an injury occurs, where, where, which does seem to happen a lot, you've already got two more top contenders in training um, and ready to go. Because honestly, I think you can't go wrong right now. If you're the UFC, I mean, you literally have three contenders at 185 towns between Yoel Romero, Jacare Souza, and Luke Rockhold that, I mean, I think you could literally just stick your, your hand in a hat and pull out one of their names, and you get a great fight with Chris Weidman. So uh, I think Luke has probably done enough, as we've said in the past, to get himself there first. But I think Yoel Romero versus Jacare on the undercard of that as the co-main event would just be the logical move, the only move, and would give these, them a fail-safe in case one of these injuries occur. I agree, and I, I, I didn't really even think about that point. I just kind of got excited to, to see that fight because, man, those two are amazing. Such power, and I think Jacare with the whole submission aspect as well as those, as, as power makes that such an interesting fight. And, I mean, I'm, I'd be happy to watch that, that fight card just for those two fights alone right there. I mean, I'll... I could wander through, you know, some pretty mediocre matches knowing that those two are going to happen. So I think that's fantastic. And uh, I, I think uh, if that would happen, let's do it. And I, and I would I would be more than happy. Um, but, man, Jacare. Jacare is a tough, tough dude. And I think, you know, it'd be hard to say it because I agree with you that I think Luke has, uh, you know, uh, has claimed that num that next one, that next chance – at Chris Weidman, but I think uh, Yoel Romero and Jacare, what a good fight. I mean, yep. clearly, clearly the, the the next contender for sure. Well, and the great thing, I think, too, is that we don't have to wait until December now. Um, you know, the other thing that kind of went down is, is the New York vote fell apart. New York is not going to happen this year. Uh, everybody was so positive about it going in. <sighs> What the apart. fuck is and, wrong with New York, man? It's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> but I guess, the, you know, the flip side of that, the good side of it, is that that card was going to be the first week of December, and they were basically putting Weidman and Rockhold on standby to be the headliner of that card. Of course, they'd love to have John Jones there with his New York ties, but we still don't know John Jones' future. We'll, we'll probably know more in the next couple of weeks. But they were putting that fight on hold until December. Um in case they could get Madison Square Garden. Now they don't have to do that anymore. I don't I don't think you wait until December just because. I think you, you waited till December for Madison Square Garden. I don't think you wait until December now. Uh, I think you could do it earlier in the year. So so that excites me. Uh, I do want to throw one little nugget. I still think that uh, Loyola Machida had a chance to beat Yoel Romero in a bigger cage. It was the small cage. Um, I am still working with UFC officials on getting this information out a little more streamlined. Um, as it stands now, I basically have to just run into operations people and ask them <laughs> what cage is up or I have to sneak into the arena or whatever. Uh, but working with them, because I know there's a lot of people, especially that like to gamble, um, that like to know the cage side because it, it means a lot into their decisions. Uh, so with that said, uh, for people that are listening to the podcast, you get this little nugget of information. Uh, easy to tell for next week, UFC 189, Tough 21 finale. Those will both be big cages. Uh, easy one there. That's the MGM Grand Garden Arena. They would never put a small cage in the MGM Grand Garden Arena. It's too big of a venue. But I have also learned that there will be big cages at a minimum all the way through August 8th 
in Nashville, Tennessee. So that means I'm going to pull up the handy rumors page on MMAJunkie.com. But Ooh. that means UFC Fight Night 71 in San Diego, big cage. UFC Fight Night 72 in Glasgow, big cage. UFC on Fox 16 in Chicago, big cage. UFC 190 in Rio de Janeiro, big cage. And UFC Fight Night 73 in Nashville, Tennessee, big cage. Now, if anything changes, I will, of course, update you. But if you're starting to get your props together, that's a little bit of bonus information for the MMA Roadshow listeners. I have been told that all the way through August 8th, it will be big cages. There you go. You would think that they would know that far enough in a, you know, like like you said now, you just kind of in advance. I mean, was that, did they know, was that a last minute decision for the Florida show that they, hey, let's go with the small cage? Did no, they? They, they, they definitely know. I, I know that through your days with the UFC, you, you understand how operations works and you see all the teams and, and who's handling what. And I mean, that's, that stuff is all determined, you know, months, you know, weeks and even months ahead of times. And, and a lot of it is based on venue size. Some of it is TV uh, restrictions and those sort of things. But they know it well in advance. It's just never really been a big topic of discussion. I don't think the USC is trying to hide anything. I just don't think they ever really wanted to bring a lot of attention to it. Um, I think there was I, – I can remember a time where a, a USC official told me, like, oh, I bet you guys didn't even know we used two size cages. And I'm like, oh, well, we actually kind of do. Uh, we, just don't know <laughs> in, we just don't know in advance when we're going to see it. Uh, so, But I think they're starting to realize, I mean – Especially wagering uh, people like to have this information, and not yes for the matchup itself. I mean, Machida versus Romero was a classic type of fight where you go, well, man, that small case really favors you know, Romero. But even more so than that, a, a lot of you know wagers, from what I'm seeing, are betting the will go or won't go the distance, and the small cage has been proven. It it creates more finishes in fights, and they know that statistically they're better off betting a won't go the distance in a smaller cage. So um, I'm trying to work with the USC on that and get them to say, listen, is there a way that we can get this information disseminated a little bit quicker because odds makers would like to, to know. And, of course, I'm also letting them know that if they'd like to just disseminate it solely through me, that will be fine. <laughs> <laughs> and there you go. I love it. I love it. People people can get their betting lines from uh, our good buddy and friend of the MMA Roadshow, John Anik, but then they'll find out their cage stuff from John Morgan, and then that'll just change all the lines right after that. I love You're it. You're dead straight. You're dead straight. So the other, thing I, the other thing I wanted to get to uh, is in an interview that I did get to do this week before I did go on vacation. I was back in Vegas for a couple of days uh, before I came out here to Mexico. It was I got a chance to talk to BJ Penn. Um, BJ Penn is going to be inducted into the USC Hall of Fame next week. Uh, as part of the first class of this revamped Hall of Fame structure, which I got to say, I'm a big fan of the way the USC is doing the Hall of Fame now. There's uh, four wings, if you will, of it. There's the modern era, and this is fighters who made their pro debut in the modern era. There are pioneers era, fighters who made their pro debut in the pioneers era. Uh, contributors, which is for individuals who made significant contributions outside of active competition. And a fight wing, which commemorates the greatest and most important bout in the sport's history. Um, and, and I love the fight wing because, first of all, uh, no offense to Stefan Bonner, but Forrest Griffin versus Stefan Bonner is definitely one of the most pivotal fights in UFC history as far as what it meant for the business. And also mm -hmm. just an incredible fight for anybody that was like I was, you know, watching the first season of The Ultimate Fighter. And then it came down to that incredible live finale. I mean, that's a moment in watching a fight that you'll never, ever forget. And it, it deserves to be commemorated somehow. But, you know, Stefan Bonner did not have the type of career that Chuck Liddell had, that Matt Hughes had, that uh, some of the other members of the USC Hall of Fame had. And I think he's deserving of being in the Hall of Fame, but not alongside those guys. And that's what this fight wing is going to do. In fact, they've already moved him into that, that wing. Um, and the first fight, of course, that's going to be is Matt Hughes versus Frank Trigg, too, um, which is going to be put into the Hall of Fame this week, as, or next week, I should say, as well, which was an incredible, incredible fight. I'll never forget watching that fight either. But uh, I say all that just to say, uh, BJ Penn, I think we all knew this guy was going to be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, certainly a throwback to um, a different era, I guess, of the sport. I mean, his career record, if you look at it, kind of like that of Randy Couture's, is not that remarkable. It's not a Fedor Emelianenko-esque career record or you know it's certainly not if you try to compare it to boxing or whatever I mean I think this is one of those guys that shows you the difference between mixed martial arts and boxing that in, in MMA I think we're a little bit more understanding of losses when guys are challenging themselves all the time fighting the best they can looking to 
push themselves to to the absolute limit or whatever. And you know, BJ Penn was certainly one of those guys. And uh, you know, Cole Coffey, I know he kind of predated your time with the UFC, but you know, I wonder, you know, was he still a guy that was that was on your radar? and uh, somebody that you were a fan of, or, or just kind of what were your thoughts of BJ Penn? For sure. I mean, uh, when you think of MMA and I think of the UFC, he's one of those names that you just can't not think of. You know, I think he put his time in and he, he did his work, and, yeah, he doesn't have, like, this huge, you know, title defense run, like, you know, people think of, like, GSP and all these guys that have all this stuff, but – you know, it's hard not to think about the beginning of the UFC and, you know, all the days and all those great fights that he was in and just and also his just willingness to, to keep doing it. You know, I mean, it's kind of he's even when he finally, you know, kind of stepped away, you know, it was it was kind of sad because he was one of the the last big names that was just really one of the guys that for me was there at the beginning. Um, like you said, I didn't, you know, I wasn't the hugest fan when, when the UFC first started. Like that first season, I, I sure as hell watched the Forrest Griffin Bonner fight, but as for anything else that season, I, I maybe caught one episode or two. But you still, you know, it was like one of those things. There were there were certain people that when you watched, you couldn't help but just be like, man, I love I love what this guy's out there doing, his mentality, the way he fights, you know, and that was BJ, you know, I mean just an incredible incredible fighter incredible heart you know was always tough a competitor wants to get in there not afraid to go in there with anybody and i think it's awesome that he's able to get in i think it's uh you know well deserved and i think it's very interesting you know i mean i like this sort of breakdown it kind of gives them some excuses to kind of bring people in different areas and in different ways guys that you know um you know, maybe don't have, like you said, the records to, to compare with a lot of guys, but that are the sport wouldn't be where it is without those guys. And, and those guys deserve to be in there. And I, I commend them on, on creating this sort of things. You know, I just I just wonder if, you know, maybe Major League Baseball could, in, could do this and maybe we'll see Pete Rose get in there. You know, I mean, <laughs> what division uh, would Pete Rose be in? Huh? Look, at the, huh? look we... at the Ohio guy working <laughs> yeah. in his local politics. <laughs> Can we get Pete Rose in here? <laughs> <laughs> only, only the Ohio guy would work in Pete Rose. Now, I, I tell you what, though, it is, it is cool. You know, speaking of, I guess, the Baseball Hall of Fame, it is kind of a good transition because the other thing I really love about where the UFC Hall of Fame is eventually going to is there is going to be a physical Hall of Fame at some point. Um, I, you know, it's, it hasn't been announced when it's going to be. You know, I, from what I understand and talking to some USC officials, they're still working out all the details. But I think this is cool. It, you know, living online is neat and having a page on the website is cool. I mean, whatever. It, it's, it's a nice honor. You know, you have your trophy sitting at home and know that you're a part of the USC Hall of Fame. But to actually have a physical Hall of Fame that people can go to and kind of make a pilgrimage to and, and see these, you know, relics of – uh, you know, the history of the sport, I think is going to be very, very cool. And it, I think we're still a ways away from having it. But, you know, two very strong possibilities that I've heard are that, one, it'll be at the new arena, uh, which is currently being constructed very quickly just off the I-15 there uh, in uh, in north of, I guess, the, the uh, northwest corner of the Las Vegas Strip in Tropicana. Um, coming together very quickly will be open in 2016. Sounds like, don't know if you saw this cold coffee, but we're going to get the uh, Coyotes, you know, we talked last week about whether or not we were going to get a hockey team. It sounds like we're getting Arizona's hockey team. I was going to say, now, now I've heard that the, the NHL came back out and was like, hey, you know, these reports are, are, are unfounded, blah, blah, blah. But, yeah, I thought there was a report that, yeah, that said, hey, by the way, Arizona Coyotes are going out there, which I think <laughs> is absolutely incredible. But you're right, that building is going up so quick. It's like... It's funny, you know, when you think of the sheer volume of how big this building is, it kind of gets lost in the whole mix of all the yeah. other big buildings. So it's like you're driving past this thing, you're driving past it, and the other day I looked over, I was like, what the hell is that? It's this nuts. huge, shiny building. And you're just like, where the fuck did that come from? <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. It's gone up so quick, and I'm so excited. And, and, I, I can't you know, wait granted, to start seeing events there. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I, uh, in my hometown in Columbus, we had the Blue Jackets. And I remember when they first came, I was so excited to go see and – you know, and it was neat to see, like, hockey. I didn't grow up watching hockey, but I love watching hockey. And I think it'd be amazing. I think Vegas needs a professional team. And I think that's a great start, you know, if we get hockey in here. And I, who knows if we can go from there. You know, I'd, I'd love if we can get a soccer team in here as well. Yeah, I mean, me too. 
So uh, no, I'm so so excited, and you well, know. and that's and I say all that because again, there's a possibility that the USC Hall of Fame could be in that arena, which I think would be really neat because certainly on USC Fight Nights, um, it would be a big attraction. I'm sure anybody that's coming into town and seeing a USC fight would love to go check out the Hall of Fame as well. But to think that it would be there during concerts, during you know hockey games, during you know if we ever do get a basketball team or something like that. Um, to have that there so that fans of other sports are kind of being exposed to the UFC and to mixed martial arts and the history of the sport, I think would be a pretty cool little marketing tool and a pretty cool way to help people continue to learn about the sport. Now, granted, I would assume that most people attending a sporting event in Las Vegas would know something about the UFC, but I'm sure that that building is going to play host to Barbara Streisand concerts or whatever. You know, I mean, who knows? As it should. As it should. <laughs> but this thing, could, this thing could really expose the sport to a lot of different uh, places. So I think that would be a pretty unique destination, although the alternate destination I've heard is – on the new USC headquarters campus, which um, I believe is set to break ground any day now, and it's supposed to be uh, completed around this time or late uh, summer, early fall next year. Uh, you, you were, of course, still with the USC when they first started rolling out the plans for this thing. It's, it's a massive, massive campus. It's supposed to be very, very impressive. They continue to, it seems to me, every time I hear something, they're, they're adding something new to their plans for it. Um, now, from what I understand, it would be this would be kind of tough because again this is a corporate headquarters so in order to have the USC Hall of Fame there you know you would have to have a separate entrance a separate parking lot separate security because you would not want normal fans having access to the the free run of the campus which will house you know the ultimate fighter uh, studios which will house um, you know this new rehabilitation center that we're hearing about I mean there's gonna be a lot of things going on there at this new campus and so you'd have to find a way to isolate the general public out of that area which I guess would probably be you know one more complication for the UFC to deal with but I mean that wouldn't be a bad option either, right? I mean, people people wanting to make this pilgrimage to the USC headquarters to, to see this thing. So I, I'm kind of torn. I see I see pros and cons both ways. Part of me would like to see it on the you know at the arena just so it seems like it would get some cross promotion with with other people and maybe help grow the sport a little bit. But at the same time, um, I mean, I see people uh, and I'm sure you did in your day working there geek out just you know, coming to the UFC headquarters, which, let's be honest, is nothing impressive to look at right now. It's just a collection of office buildings. I agree. And, and you're right. I mean, it, it poses a whole new uh, security issues that they have to take care of. And, you know, it's going to definitely be outside of the beaten path. I mean, you're going to have to go down 15 and then and cross around 215 or whatever. It's going to take you a little bit to get there. That's over so by it, my house. That's not around the beaten path. Oh, that is so far. I know. You look like <laughs> out there where the where the zombies are first going to attack or where everybody's going to run to when the zombies attack the, the, the casinos. Um, but you're right. I liked – out of the two, I definitely favor the cross promotion, being in people's face, being there where people can easily see it. Um, you know, I think that's how you keep – you keep relevant and keeping people's faces, you know, but you're right, man. Pe people would go to the tough gym now, which is in the middle of nowhere, just, uh, you know, just random buildings, you know, in like a warehouse district, you know, but people still like to go by there. And even the offices now are not that great. But uh, yeah, if I had to pick a favor where I think fans would appreciate the most, I think they would want to be where they're at the strip and then, hey, take five minutes out of your way and then you're at the Hall of Fame as opposed to taking a 20 minute drive to get to the hall of fame, yeah, no. you know, but that's, you know, that's just my, uh, my preference, but I think either one, I, I think as long as they have, it's great. If not, you know, you could take it to the fine state of Ohio and put it next to the, uh, the football <laughs> hall of fame or the, uh, rock and roll hall of fame in, in Cleveland. There's many, many great options there. So uh, real estate must be cheap. That's the only reason those places <laughs> are there, man. <laughs> that is true. Don't, don't, don't step in the water there. Don't put your toes in the water there. But, all right, well, catch so fire. <laughs> that's our that's that's our Hall of Fame discussion. We'll see how that happens. It's it's going to be. Uh, I'm anxious to see what eventually comes of it. It's going to be a while. I don't, it's going to be a story to track for a while. But so I, what I want to do now is I want to play this BJ Penn interview. Um, again, I had a chance to speak with him. It, BJ Penn. He had a little. Uh, he had a little humor in, in place, which was awesome. He had a little joke that he'll tell right off the bat. Um, and was pretty wide open about everything, which was great. Uh, did have some – you know, I talked to him a lot about his fighting career and what, you know, what uh, this honor means to him and, and what his fighting career meant to him. But talked about some other things, which I think will be interesting to take note. Um, 
asked him about his involvement in the Mount Kea Observatory, which I didn't know much about, but I'd kind of been looking at his Instagram, and uh, he had kind of posted this picture, which was uh, this grassroots movement about this observatory uh, in Hawaii, which is worth reading about. It's a, it's a really unique uh, kind of a battle they're having in Hawaii. And, um, he, I, I thought maybe he was trying to get a little bit politically involved, and, and uh, he had kind of an interesting response to that. He's also taken to growing taro root, um, which I didn't know a whole lot about either, but uh, kind of funny to think about BJ Penn farming. So anyway, uh, listen, anytime somebody calls you from the USC and says, hey, do you want to talk to BJ Penn? Uh, I was a few hours from heading to the airport and, and leaving, but uh, certainly not going to turn down the opportunity to talk to a legend. So uh, sit back, relax, and uh, we'll play you that conversation while cold coffee and I ramp up on another round of frosty beverages or green drink, depending on what's <laughs> happening at the cold coffee household. Hey, BJ, you're on with uh, John Morgan from MMA Junkies. John Morgan, what's going on, sir? Not much, BJ. How you doing, brother? All right, man. Taking it easy. Good for you, man. Well, let's get started, man. Right away, BJ okay. Penn, UFC Hall of Famer, man. How does that sound to you? Yep. It's very exciting. Very, very exciting. Um, yep. Um, when the news broke, a couple of people over here were saying, they're getting indicted. I said, no, inducted, inducted. <laughs> inducted. <laughs> well played, well played. How did you get the notice? How did you find out? Um, Dana called me and let me know, and then they didn't tell me about that that whole uh, thing that they were showing on, on the... Um, uh, on Fox and, and all that, that whole uh, video they had, they didn't tell me nothing about it because they know I got a big mouth, so they just uh, <laughs> they just put it out there and everybody's telling me congrats, I'm talking to people, I don't know what's going on. And uh, it was very exciting, though, very, very exciting. And uh, you know what was even um, just as exciting as that was I got such a, um, not that I didn't think I, I should have been in the Hall of Fame, but everybody was just so positive and, you know, just kind of congratulating me on my career and... <laughs> You know, it was a nice way to go out. You know, didn't you know? Because I'm a very um, controversial fighter at times, but you know, it was great. There was no controversy. Period. You know, it was just great talk. You're right. I, I didn't see anything negative. At all. I'm, I'm curious because I think most people thought, you know, you were a surefire Hall of Famer right away. You were going to get in. You said you felt like you did deserve to be there. But was there some part of you that thought maybe they won't give me this honor? Um. No, no, you know, Dana told me for a long time. Me and Dana have had, had uh, talks about it for a long, long time. So I, I kind of knew, you know, but we just didn't know the day. And, you know, it's just, you know, uh, you just, you never know. You never know what life holds. So now we can get it, set it in stone. And I can go back about my daily life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's you've been at the top, BJ, obviously. I mean, you've been a UFC champion, but that's something that's just for a moment, and there's always somebody else coming up looking to take your spot. This is an honor that nobody can take away from you, and this is an honor that is forever. D is, there, is there any comparing the feelings at all? I mean, does it compare at all to the feeling of being a champion, knowing now that you're going to be recognized as a Hall of Famer? You know what, honestly, you know, it's funny you say that because it seemed, I mean, how everybody was treating me after they brought it out, it was on the news and everything in Hawaii. It was like they were treating me better than when I won the title. So it's like, man, this is bigger than the championship, you know. It just, uh, you know, it felt, it, felt like I was, it felt like I was the champion again. I walked around, everybody coming up to me left and right. And it, was, it is, it's a great honor. And, you know, it, and it goes to show, too, that, you know, the Hall of Fame, you know, it. Yeah, it's, it's not just, you know, because when UFC's Hall of Fame has kind of come up, I guess it was so hardcore, just we knew about it, and now the Hall of Fame is, is becoming more serious, and the UFC is, is is taking it more serious, I think. Yeah, very true. I, I like. Do you like the, the way they've reorganized it and the restructuring of it? Are you a fan of the way it's set up now? Yeah, yeah, I, I think they did uh, different wings or something. So is it a building? Is it an actual building then it, with it, different wings, or is this just? It's in going, our head for now. I was going to say, it's my <laughs> understanding there will be an actual <laughs> physical building at some point. There will be an actual physical Hall of Fame at some point. Okay. Okay, so right now it's just on a different wing in our brain. <laughs> 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 that's great man well listen I mean it's been right at a year since you last competed I know you've been taking some time to relax and enjoy life but how, how much have you thought about fighting during that time has it occupied your mind or have you been able to kind of put it aside 
you know what? At first, uh, I was I thought I was gonna have a easy. Uh, I was gonna have a hard time. You know uh, that I was gonna want to fight and all that, but you know I'm I'm fine. Uh, everything's uh, everything's good, and I just been you know, you know like, cause I because I you know I've been in the gym my whole life. You know I still go to the gym. I go do some cardio, try to you know for my health and stuff like that. But you know I've been in the gym my whole life, so it's kind of good to just catch up with other different things and. You know, just kind of other other stuff that I wanted to do, you know, and just take my time, not rushing, because it was always, you know, I'm either in training camp or I'm rushing to do something because i got to get in training camp soon again. And within that time, I'm training all day, every day anyway. So it's nice. It's nice. I guess the thing that we always hear about that's toughest for professional athletes and especially fighters is number one, you know, just the glory, the the attention, you know, being, you know, that thrill of that moment and also just the competition itself. Have you missed either of those two things or have you been able to, to just, you know what? Yeah. I mean, of course you're going to miss the glory and the attention, but with that, you got to realize the determination, the dedication and the desire that that's going to, you know, to get that glory and, to get that attention, and, and, and then with 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 Doug said, I mean, with uh, I mean, how can you have somebody who says, BJ, how, how do you how, how do you get good? How do you get good at something? Right? You're like it before desire, dedication, and all these things, you gotta love it. You gotta love what you're doing, you know. And yeah, I mean, you got you, you the um, UFC and MMA. I mean, that's a sport. You cannot be 99 percent in. You cannot be 80 percent in. You. You gotta, you gotta be 99.9 percent, and you gotta be 150 percent, and if not, you're gonna get, you're gonna end up in the hospital. So I mean, it's a serious business, you know. But uh, you know, it, it, it is. It, but with all that said, it's, it's fun, man. It's, it's, it's good fun. Yeah. But oh man. What do you think the future holds for you? I, I, I wonder. I, I saw. You know, a little bit of a political statement there in in the uh, your involvement with the We Are Mount Akea campaign, and is that something that you want to do? Start getting involved in politics a little bit more around Hawaii, especially. Uh, no, no, no. I'm I'm not a politician. I would try to consider myself headed more towards being a businessman than a politician. Um, uh, yeah, you know that's just uh, something that's going on up here. I probably shouldn't really get into that too much on this on this show, but. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm just moving along. Uh, you know, it's, it's common knowledge. I got, um, you know, bjpen.com pushing, trying to push what, what we do there. And then, um, I got the UFC gyms with, uh, with uh, the UFC. We're partners in, in, uh, the gym in Wahiwa, a gym in Honolulu. We're trying to make another gym in Mililani that should be coming around the corner. So that's kind of the stuff as far as that's kind of just what I'm doing in business wise. And, and then in anything else, I'm trying to do a little farming here and there. So I'm just trying to, uh, you know, just just keep my, keep some businesses uh, moving. Sure, taro farming, right? Is that well, how did that become an interest yeah. of yours? You know what? Um, uh, just uh, you know, it's a, uh, of course taro is always big in Hawaii, but uh, you know, it's just a, it's a beautiful plan. It's a, it's 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 just fun, it's fun being involved with uh, the taro and. You know, you, of course, you got the the poi, uh, the, uh, but besides the taste and all that stuff, uh, you know, I, I also, you know, just it looked beautiful. It looked like beautiful pools with the taro plants in there, and very uh, relaxing, very comfortable. That's cool. I mean, are you? Is this a commercial expedition for you? I mean, you're trying to make some money off of it, or is yeah. it just a hobby? Yeah, yeah, no, that too, that too. We we want to make it big. Uh, we're we're um. We're messing around with the tail, not because it's the past, because it's the future. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. I saw. It. Is that something that can be used outside of Hawaii? I'll be. I'll be honest. I'm. I'm not that familiar with. It. Is it something that people can use outside of Hawaii, or is it just kind of, uh, just a Hawaiian thing that's going to be there on the islands? No, you know, it's, I. I think it's yeah, like anything else. It's education, and you know, getting people to, uh, you know, seeing what it is and start eating it, and yeah, I think it's uh, a work in progress. No doubt. Well, you know, obviously, BJ accomplished something so few fighters have, winning winning a title in two different weight classes. People have talked about it since, but, you know, you remain one of the only couple of guys to do it. Do you, do you think other fighters will be able to do it, or do you think the sport has changed and, and it's not possible anymore? Well, we'll do it at the two times, Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe they'll be able to do it with the 10 pounds, but it'll be a little bit harder with the 15-pound difference, you know. 
I mean, if you're doing 135, 145, that's one thing. But 55 and 70, yeah, it's a whole different thing. Yeah, no doubt about it. Do you, I know that you're busy these days. Do you have a chance to, to watch fighting much these days? And if so, I mean, is there anybody that, that you enjoy watching? You know what? I, I, I don't I don't get to sit down and, and, uh, and, and watch the fighting too much. Uh, you know, just on my regular day, yeah. But if, if, a, some, if a big fight comes on and it's a fight that I would have been into, you know, like a, like a John Jones Cormier or, you know, a big fight, then, then I'll, 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 I'll think about sitting down and, you know, restructuring my day to watch it. But besides that, I don't get to catch up on, on the fights too much. I know the Hawaii guys and I know the champions, but if the champion is fighting just some guy, I'm, I'm, I'm probably not going to sit down. I'll probably just catch the news on the Internet or something. Yeah, no doubt. It's understood. I'm sure you go to bjpin.com to get all the latest news on that. <laughs> <laughs> I got <him>. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Well, I'm curious. What do you see in the fighters today? I just wonder, you know, as the sport is evolving and it's growing and obviously it's getting, you know, bigger and better and, and all that, but I don't know. Do you feel like maybe fighters today approach things a little bit differently than you did? I feel like, you know, you were always trying to fight the toughest fight possible every single time out. And now I think guys – I don't want to say they're protecting their record, but they're trying to build win streaks and that sort of thing. And I, I feel like that wasn't ever the goal for you. It wasn't about building win streaks. It was about literally just finding the biggest, baddest, toughest available challenge to you at the time. You know that. You know, no, it really, it really was at that time. You know, and and uh, um, you know, I guess you know things are different, but you know, I, I guess I mean you could look back and say, yeah, look how stupid DJ was for that. You know, I'm like, <laughs> he could have made so much more money, or he could have did this and that, and. And on the other hand, somebody could say, yeah, but then he wouldn't have as much fans or, you know, and, you know, it was just, uh, I just loved fighting back then. I don't know if I made uh, the wrong decisions or the right decisions. I mean, I know I'm never going to, uh, you know, I'll make money off fighting, you know, ever again. Uh, actually stepping in and, and swinging punches with somebody, but, but uh, you know, uh, you know, it, a lot of people could ask, you know, are you looking, looking back, you wish you just, Try to, you know, make as much money as you could and this and that, but I don't know. It was fun. That's just who I was. Like, I couldn't help it. Either way, I couldn't have changed it. No doubt. Well, such I know such a competitive person as well, and you did accomplish so much and built so many fans and, and really became one of the true legends of the sport. I mean, in retrospect, do you feel like you accomplished everything you wanted to do? Are, are you happy with where you leave yourself in the sport? You know what? I, uh, after my last fight, and then you're gonna stop fighting, and definitely I wasn't, I wasn't happy. I always thought I had more to accomplish, and I always felt like, man, I just want to show everybody one time, how, like how really good I can be, and you know, I, I swear I'm better than what anybody's ever saw. You know, I still haven't got to let people see my me at my best, my best fight yet. But now looking now here a year separated from that. Uh, you know, but those are thoughts that I've always thought my whole career, you know, that like I've never, my best performance is still yet to be seen. But now looking a year later back and I'm kind of more relaxed and everything, like I'm kind of glad I, I don't have that thought creeping back into my head. And I'm just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I can put something like that behind because that ain't something easy to put behind. Yeah, no doubt. Well, what do you do now, BJ? Do you, do you kind of, uh, after this, ceremony and after this honor do you kind of pull back and, and be a little private and enjoy your family or can fans still keep up with you and interact with you social media or see you places what what what, what do you want how do you, how do you see it playing out for yourself um as, as time goes by i see myself yeah um just um, being more and more involved with um business and kind of just um you know I mean, we got we got a website, you know, we got bjpen.com out there, and you probably once in a while they'll push something out from me, or maybe you know something. And of course, you can contact me through through my um through my Twitter and stuff like that. But yeah, I just see myself uh, after this Hall of Fame thing. You know, a lot of people ask me why don't you train people and this and that and, and do different things, but uh, I I don't know it's just. I still love the martial arts and everything about it, and of course I'll always be around, you know, in different areas. But it's it, it's very yes, you know, that was MMA. You gotta be, uh, you gotta be everything. You gotta be 100 percent in, and you know, whether you're coaching or whatever you're doing. Uh, I know it did. It has uh, MMA has taken up a huge part of my life, but it also gave me a wonderful life too, and. Um, 
it uh it uh, it's hard it's hard to um it's hard to still be in the gym like this last year not training you know it's I the best I best I felt for a while you know just just uh just in regular daily life so it's good it's good life is good. I was gonna say, I think you've earned the right to be a little bit selfish now and just uh, kind of pull back and enjoy your your family. Like you said, you sacrificed so much. Now it's time for you, right? Yeah, and and I I still I just like the same mentality I had in in uh, doing martial arts. I just try to do that in other things it's around, you know. Fantastic. Well, BJ, I appreciate the try time. To do your best. I appreciate the time very much, and I definitely look forward to uh, to seeing you in Las Vegas uh, for the ceremony. Thank you, man. We're gonna yeah, we're gonna have a lot of fun and right off into the sunset after that. Beautiful. <laughs> Thanks, BJ. Okay. Thanks, John. Welcome back to the MMA Roadshow. That was the prodigy, BJ Penn, man. Obviously an honor to speak to him anytime you can, and I will uh, I will enjoy seeing him inducted into the USC Hall of Fame. Uh, okay, John Morgan, I am here in San Luis Potosi, Mexico, where it is absolutely pouring down rain outside, uh, but it is a beautiful 70 degrees. Meanwhile, Cold Coffee uh, has found himself another beverage, uh, according to his <laughs> Twitter account, and I believe it's about 109 degrees there, so... Uh, a good 40 degrees between us, which I am proud to say I am enjoying before I get to come back home to Sin City uh, later this week and enjoy that air. But why don't you why don't you share with our listeners uh, <laughs> what what the beverage of choice was during the break? Well, you know, I mean, I finished off the Bud Light, you know, and so now I had to reach for something. I, I don't I wasn't quite ready to jump into the JMO, you know, so I opted for a uh, some Fireball that I happen to have in the fridge. I think for my Maybe my last birthday. I don't know. <laughs> it's been in there for a while, but uh, yeah, it's a it's a tasty beverage. I, I like I like the way it makes your breath smell. Now, to to let the uh, MMA Roadshow listeners in on a, a little bit of the behind the scenes action, where does the Fireball sit in relation in your refrigerator to the Moonshine? <laughs> it's two two rows down. <laughs> two rows down from the Moonshine. I forgot about the Moonshine in there. <laughs> Dude, I'm a fucking, I'm a lush. <laughs> but it's like, I don't, it's there for like when people come over or like I have people to like, to, to hang at the pool or whatever. So I've not, I don't drink it really by myself unless now that we're taping this podcast, I'm fucking doing shots by myself. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is great. But hey, did you, you know. Uh, hey, if it makes you feel any better, did you, did you read the, uh, the, the review? It was pointed out to me. That there was a review on iTunes about the MMA Roadshow. Oh no! Uh, in, <laughs> have, have you had a chance to have you have you reviewed any of our reviews yet? I, I'll be I, honest. I, I I did a little while. It's been it's been a minute. You know, um, it, I appreciate people doing the reviews. I have not uh, been there for a a, a minute to take a look at them. Uh, <laughs> what is right. it, what did it say? What, we'll, what did it say? We'll just take a minute to read this here. This is posted by <laughs> Oglethorpe on June twelfth, two thousand fifteen. I haven't. <laughs> I haven't gone back and paid attention to when this week was. I, I'm guessing this has something to do with the New Orleans. New Orleans yes. <laughs> but let me just read this to you. This was our first three-star review, by the way. Three-star Oh, review. no. Three-star. Uh-oh. The early episodes where MMA is talked and guests had interesting things on the topic of MMA to say show good potential. However, Morgan's alcoholism seems to be greatly affecting the show. <laughs> the last few shows have been borderline unlistenable. If he is able to handle his liquor and not get too sloppy while talking to knowledgeable people, the show could become entertaining. His interviews with folks at the events are solid, so we can still appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> you are a sloppy drunk, Morgan. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, hey, you, you, but you did what you told me not to do. You said don't read the comments. That was not that bad. Oglethorpe, I, uh, you know, uh, I, one, personally can't stand my voice most times of the day whether it be sober or not. But I know a lot of times when I hear myself afterwards, I'm like, God, I sound like a fucking terrible drunk. And then I was thinking about it. I was like, I wasn't even drinking right there. I was like, I think I just have that, like, Mickey Rourke drunk voice or something. You know, I'm just like, I sound drunk when I'm not really drunk. So when I'm drunk, it sounds even worse. But, uh, well, no, hey, you know, 
shit happens. But, I mean, the show is, I mean, I don't think we've had a problem where there's ever been a point where it's like, oh, you know, that's not going to do whatever, you know. But, you know, New Orleans. <laughs> New Orleans was close. <laughs> New Orleans was close. New Orleans is the one show I think I have not went back and listened to. Just for the <laughs> fact of the, where it's like that night was such a crazy shit show that we we went on afterwards, I think. And we've alluded about how the rest of that night went uh in new orleans <laughs> that you know it, that was a pretty wild and crazy night but you know that was awesome it was so much fun i mean new orleans what what a crazy town and uh you know i think uh you know we do what we do you know you're either gonna love us or you hate us you know and uh <laughs> we're just gonna keep on doing it you know no doubt no doubt all right well we're gonna do something a little different now i wanted to since i am on vacation since i haven't been able to do a ton of interviews um I'll, but i still like bringing content from uh, kind of our travels and and things that we're doing in the course of the world of MMA, uh, I thought I'd do something a little bit different, and that was bring you an interview that actually Ben Folks did. Our own Ben Folks um, did an interview, a sit-down interview with Duke Rufus, and uh, you, Cold Coffee, were there to film this, to tape it. Uh, you were part of this gym visit to Rufus Sport, and I guess uh, we're, we're going to play this in two parts, and I'm going to divide it up because it's a pretty extensive interview and it's very thorough. And if you don't know a lot about Duke Rufus, I think you're really going to like him after this interview, man. He's very, very open, very, very, uh, man, just honest about everything. And really interesting to hear this. This first segment that you're going to hear is about, you know, Rufus. He, he, he tells a lot about his family history and actually gets pretty emotional uh, as he's telling about it. And the parallels between his own life and that of Anthony Pettis and Sergio Pettis in particular um, is very incredible. Now, he's close with all of his team. He talks about Ben Askren in this segment as well. But the parallels between his own life and Anthony and Sergio Pettis' life is really unique. And you'll hear later in the interview where, where you actually jump in cold coffee. We'll talk about that later. But um, – you know, where he talks about the importance of fight camps, and I think if there's something that you and I have definitely seen over and over in our travels, it's that you know there is an importance to what fight camp you're in, and it's not necessarily just about um, you know who's teaching the best techniques and who's the best wrestler and who's the best striker and all that. It's it's really much more of an emotional and a psychological bond that that helps fighters really get to that next level. So I think you're going to hear a lot about that in this in this first segment that we're going to play, but I guess I just want to get your thoughts uh cold coffee on on this. Uh, I know it's probably been a while since you've gone back and and listened to this whole thing, but um just if you can kind of put yourself back in that moment where you and Ben Folks were sitting in the the Rufus Sport Gym and talking with Duke Rufus and again being very very open, very honest and very emotional um and just kind of what your impression was you know it, was it different than what you thought of duke before did you know duke that well before just just give me your thoughts on the whole experience you know i had known duke from watching him you know mentor his fighters and he'd be there on fight night and he was always always wonderful to work with throughout the week you know a lot of times you know you know uh it's fight week you know in the ufc we need this from your fighter we need this we need this and he would always be very open but he always w had the mindset of protecting his fighter as well he'd be as open and and have his fighter do as much as needed but without jeopardizing the fighter during fight week and i always respected that but to see such a candid and open duke rufus was just amazing i mean um he lived it to exactly what i thought would be um you know, he pulled no punches. He said everything. And to see him really open up about his family that I really didn't know the history of his family and let alone growing up in the shadow of a superstar brother, which really parallels, you know, the whole Anthony and Sergio thing. Um, it was amazing. It was amazing to be there and to, to get a chance to chat with him. I thought the... Um, the, the gym was outstanding. I thought the level of athletes there were was incredible. I thought the um, uh, the way that they handled themselves in practice, the stuff, the way they worked it, they went hard. I mean, they went, you know, but they were smart. You know, I mean, I know a lot of times there were people who were thinking that, oh, hey, you know, gyms, some gyms, you know, fighters, they don't, they just let their fighters go too hard and people get hard. You know, he made a point, you know, when the practice went on, made sure everybody strapped on their headgear, people were putting their shit on. Safety was definitely in the forefront and it was good to see that, which kind of, you know, cleared up all that, you know, and uh, it was amazing to hear him chat and it was a very, very good interview and he's, he's a wonderful individual and I would love hearing more and like pouring more into his history because I mean man what an interesting dude 
you know, we, we, we see how his fighters does and, you know, and do how well they do. But Duke was a badass himself, you know, and then, you know, to get a little glimpse of hearing him talk about him coming up and how badass his brother was, you know, and it's, uh, you know, it was a it was a great, great time, great interview. And uh, I think people will uh, definitely have their eyes open a little bit to to Duke and why he maybe seems the way he does and how he handles himself. And he was very respectful of um, other uh, coaches and other organizations, you know, and it's a. that's what I love. That's what I love about MMA is that a lot of these guys that are up there and everybody's like, oh, they know this coach, they know this coach. They're almost like they could be these huge superstar coaches, but most of them are the most down to earth, wonderful individuals, very open hearts. And it makes, I think, anybody that's ever did any sort of MMA or any sort of martial arts, you know, you have that love for your instructor when you reach that bond where somebody's pushed you beyond what you thought you could do. And you know, I know I've been there in my past, and and it's interesting to hear somebody talk about that. But then, let alone to hear now from the coach's side that same love and affinity for his athletes coming out as well. I mean, it was moving. It was it was it was wonderful to hear, and uh, I can understand why the bond is so tight between him and his athletes. Very cool. Very well said, man. That's a great insight. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna we're gonna play the first part of this. Uh, this interview with Duke Rufus. Again, this is between Ben Folks and Duke Rufus, uh, MMA Junkies on Ben Folks, of course, the co-main event podcast, Ben Folks as well. So if you like this, uh, because we've put up little bits and pieces of this uh, on Junkie, but we haven't put up the whole thing, and, and I think the interview is good enough that I think people really enjoy it, both from Ben's side and from Duke Rufus' side. So if you enjoy it, be sure and tweet at Ben Folks MMA at Duke Rufus, let them know you dug it. Uh, what we're going to do, play the first part of it now because I think there's a pretty good little break as far as where they, they kind of go in two different paths. And, and when we come back from that, that first segment, uh, I do want to touch on one more topic, and that was the, the big Reebok reveal that happened the last couple of days and just get your kind of initial thoughts on that cold coffee and, and give a few of my own. But in the meantime, uh, we didn't have much time during this segment, but we, we, you probably need another shot of uh, <laughs> fireball anyway, if, if not some of that quality moonshine that you've got sitting uh, three racks up. So uh, while, while we figure out which direction we're going in there, you guys sit back and uh, listen to uh, Ben Folks interviewing Duke Rufus as Cold Coffee was behind the camera recording all the action. <laughs> Talking about your dad is a, reminds me. It's a good place to start. Uh, your brother and you were right. Were, were both kickboxers. Did Did you feel like uh, you know growing up in that family? Did you feel like there was a, a choice that you made, or do you feel like you're kind of funneled into that? Uh, both. You know, I, I was involved with other sports, but uh, unfortunately, I found my sister dead when I was 15 years old of uh, uh, SIDS and sudden infant death syndrome. It was a pretty traumatic experience. Um, and my grades really struggled, so I was really serious about football at the time, but um, I had the academically ineligible to do football, so I had done martial arts, trained and did karate my whole life tournaments, but um, that at that time I turned 16 and I was ineligible to do sports, and I was wrestling at the time, I had to sit out of wrestling, and uh, I turned my full energy back into martial arts, which the thing then was PK kickboxing. My brother was four years older than me, so when I'm 16, I see him winning the, the world championship on ESPN and in front of a huge audience in Atlanta. And I mean, I'd always followed my brother. It was, you know, it's our family affair. The first fight I saw was here in Milwaukee. When I was five years old, Benny the Jedder Akitas fought at the Milwaukee Arena. So I, I literally grew up around this. Um, but that's the turning point where I was set at wanting to compete, and as well, I started uh, teaching full time for my family as well. Now, when you guys were both uh, kickboxing, you know, you you had said before that you felt like your brother was the better kickboxer, and then oh. even more. Oh yeah, he is. I mean, without a doubt. I mean, numbers don't lie. He's got more wins than me, and you know, he's beaten some really quality opponents. I mean. Um, I'm the biggest overachiever around. I'm not the best athlete. I'm not a genetic specimen. Um, my thing is, I, I, you know, I grew up around my brother. My dad's a great coach, and and um, my dad always put us in an environment to always seek out the best. You know, it, when we wanted to get our boxing game better, we went to the best boxing coach. Luckily, at a Olympian boxing coach here in Milwaukee, Israel Acosta was able to help us. 
And that's just the mentality, and, I, and that's something that my dad's taught me. That's why I, I try and surround myself with really good coaches. You know, Ben Asker, an elite wrestler, and his staff are coaches who help us. Daniel Vanderlei, who's a third degree black belt under Carlson Gracie, lived with junior and senior, and, and I, I go way back with him back when I was training Stefan Bonner. So I really try and surround myself with the best possible coaching assets that we can, even the guys who do our strength and conditioning at next level. Um, they train JJ Watt. So I, I just, that's the one thing I learned from my dad that uh, has been an invaluable lesson. It kind of seems like you and the, the Pettis brothers kind of have uh, a lot of that stuff in common. Like, I was talking to Sergio and he was talking about, you know, the influence of his brother, you know, seeing him, you know, and being around the same age and seeing his brother uh, ahead of him, like fighting that kind of stuff. So, I think that, that's that the biggest asset I am for Sergio. Because, you know, my brother was just a prolific star. I mean, and him, Rick and Anthony are so much alike in their fighting style, especially when Rick was young. When he was a lighter fighter, he was a, he was a whirling dervish like Anthony. You just didn't know what uh, was going to hit you, his, his, his old school style. Before he switched to K1 and got a little bigger, he was, you know, super acrobatic, unorthodox, a lot like Anthony. Where Sergio and I were very textbook, very... Um, methodical fighters and as well the the whole you know I didn't have the internet luckily but you know people tweet you Instagram you hey you suck you, you ain't this you ain't that you know and I, I really help him deal with being in the shadow of Anthony it's not a bad thing though I mean it's it's helped people are like well you're in the shadow of your brother but no what I got opportunities faster because of being Rick Rufus's brother and Pat Rufus's son at the end of the day I still got to win and perform but it did fast track my career and same with Sergio so there's that double-edged sword I, I always look for the positive in every situation and really focus on that I, I, I like to confront you know, all the negativity, but always seek a positive. And the, the upside still of being Anthony's brother is way better than the downside of it. You know, same thing with my brother. At times I, I was frustrated and, um, you know, I want to be like my brother. But no, the difference between Sergio and Anthony and my brother and I, Sergio is doing the work. When I was Sergio's age, I didn't commit myself the way. It took me till I was 24 to figure it out, where Sergio's only going to be 22 this summer and he's really understands how to commit himself to this uh, profession but you know that was kind of my thing and I figured it out and I used my experience to coach from there. Well when we were talking to him yesterday and he was saying you know like Duke is like my dad you know that, that we, they, since they lost their father uh, and they you know, said you know that you really kind of filled that role for them. They, were you aware of that going into that, that relationship when it developed? Not how it not their situation it took me a while to figure out what happened to the boys but I mean they've Anthony you know everyone's like you're so close with these guys of course I am they've been on my team the longest you know Anthony uh, goes back to two gym locations before he goes back to the old old roots when I lived in my crappy warehouse in downtown Milwaukee you know so I mean when you're close with someone it's, it's based on time that being said I am honored that's what's real valuable to me is my relationship and that's a big thing even with all the fighters I try and create a relationship with the athletes because I feel like when we create a bond we you know I have a, I have a pound sign we we grind together we shine together you know it's like you win as a team you lose as a team you learn as a team and uh, and with those guys it's been really cool I mean Anthony's the godfather and my daughter um, it was probably the neatest experience I've seen being in, in combat sports is seeing him buy his mom a house and a car for Christmas. Because at the end of the day, you know, that you can see the title belts and, and the fame, a little bit of the fortune. But, you know, I truly believe, because that's what I learned in Thailand, all the Thai fighters were always sending money home to their family. They, they fought because they had a purpose. Their purpose was to provide for their family. And uh, that's something that I really respect and love about uh, Anthony and Serge, they, they think about their mother first and that's that that to me is a life lesson that they learned and that respect It's actually um, a lot of people don't know my family and I were a little disconnected and um, I'm gonna try and not cry about this, but um, when I saw Anthony uh, do that to his mom, I uh, Immediately reached out. I, I hadn't spoke to my dad for a while. I reached out to my brother Rick and uh, we all united this year at Christmas. I was 
just moved by the whole situation. And as well, um, being a parent, you know, I'm thinking to myself, someday my daughter's going to be Anthony's age. And I, I hope that she treats me with the respect and admiration that Anthony, Sergio, and their brother Ray have for their mother and the respect they have for their father. So if you want your children to, to be respectful, you have to cheat teach them to be respectful and um, you know they, they can say that I'm a role model in, in their life but it's it, it goes both ways uh, they're, they're role models to me too and that's what makes uh, a relationship a two-way street I'm happy about it so what was the, the uh, you said that your family you guys were disconnected what was the, the disconnect over? Uh, you know just sometimes you know, not unlike other martial arts families or fighting families you know the Mayweather's not always on the same page, even Oscar De La Hoya with his father, Roy Jones with his dad. This is a tough thing to do as a family sometimes. And, you know, honestly, you let your pride get in the way of love. And um, I'm just getting too old. Love over pride, and I'm just done with it. I mean, you know, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, family first. And here we are, just better than ever. And that's what it's all about. It seems like, especially when you're as close with fighters as you are with, like, Sergio and Anthony, like, it's got to be tough. Uh, when they lose, I mean, like that last fight for Sergio, we were talking about it yesterday, and he, the first round, he's like, I felt like a god, I could do anything. You look at him, he looked like he could do absolutely anything, and then he gets up with one punch. I mean, how do you take the ups and downs? And the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat. I mean, that's why we love this roller coaster, though. I mean, I don't gamble, but the closest thing to gambling to me is a prize fight. I mean, like you said, he's doing great. Dana said the nicest compliment to him. You know, his head was down in the dumps. He goes, kid, it's just a fight. You know, you're doing great. You know, everyone knows the upside of Surge. He's just going to have to go through the rocky road of maturing in the UFC. But, yeah, it's it's a tough one. I mean, uh, you know, I'm really close with a lot of the guys. Eric Koch, uh, one of the worst experiences I've had besides the two boys losing on the same night was when Eric Koch, and Anthony fought back to back in Chicago. Here I gotta leave Eric who's bloody and bleeding after he lost to Ricardo Amos and put my happy face on and and go, uh, hey Anthony, let's do this, you know. That's the hardest thing. I mean, even you know, it was hard the night of uh, Dos Anjos and and with Surge and everything that happened, you gotta stay positive, you know what I mean? So I try and be as strong as I can and that's I think my experience with being a parent recently has helped my coaching because, uh, you know, they're miserable. There's nothing you're going to tell them that's going to make things better. You just try and be positive and uh, be there for them. You know, the good thing I have, I've been right where Anthony was at on the top of the world and gotten beat. I've been right where Sergio was. You're coming up, you're looking great, you're doing everything. And, you know, the good thing I have a lot of experience and I can give them advice on how to bounce back. You know, I hate to sound cliche, but... That's what they say, a true champion is not the guy who's never lost. It's the guy who knows how to lose and come back. That's why Muhammad Ali, you know, Sugar Ray Robinson to me are the greatest boxers ever in the boxing game because it's not that they were perfect. They, they had some setbacks and they came on back and beat even better fighters. So, you know, they are tough. It is an emotional roller coaster. Every time those, th every trip I have an emotional hangover, yeah. whether the high of winning or the low of losing. You know, the, the, the hardest losses always are where you see someone get roughed up or knocked out. The, to me, that's what I work really hard at in here, um, is to teach good defense, teach good skills so you don't get beat up. The beauty of the why jiu-jitsu is awesome. Most of the time, yeah, you could possibly break a limb, tear a knee, and a dangerous submission, you're not going to receive brain damage, you know? So I'm really cognizant of, um, the, you can see those pictures over there? They're a really good friend of mine who um, almost died in the boxing ring, Gerald McCollum, one of my trainers, and him and I all train together. So I'm really cognizant when I train people. I don't, cerebrally, I don't want people to get messed up. So that was a tough night for me. You know, we had to go to the hospital and... The observation those are always scary moments but it's when part he, of the game i think it was after the first round where he comes back you know and it seemed like that taking that punch to the eye early on how much do you think that that affected things he was talking about that he, he felt like he couldn't see out of that eye and it seemed like the whole fight kind of changed after that. yeah definitely i mean there's a few other things i'd say that would i don't want to make excuses i think maybe we should have waited a little longer to fight i think sometimes you get so anxious he wanted to get back in there and I, I just think it was it was harder, you know, 
um, getting up for the fight. Not not saying getting up for the fight, but being totally ready. You know, you come right off of that huge Gilbert Melendez win. And, and all the credit to Dos Anjos. I mean, he fought a great fight. He was there to win, and, and he did. So, I mean, the best man that night was Rafael, and he's representing the championship. Yeah, it was tough. I think Anthony took that shot and definitely bothered him. I mean, for me, I coach these guys, but I'm not their boss. So I, I offer words of encouragement, especially my, my relationship with Anthony and guys like Ben. They're the elder statesmen on my team. Not that they're that old, but they're really mature guys, and they've really got their, their lives put together. That I'm, I'm not like the boss coach with those guys. I'm the advisor. Ben and Anthony, they're pretty alpha dudes there. So I let them make their decisions. And, you know, Anthony, if he wanted to stop fighting, he can stop fighting. You know, and it, he wanted to keep going. Even through the fight, though, he was competitive, trying to submit and, and make it happen. That's just who Anthony is, though. He's never um, been a type of guy who quits. There's a great YouTube video. Um, one of his fights here in Milwaukee gets slammed. His shoulder pops out of socket. He gets up, and he finds a way to knock a guy out with a head kick. I mean, when you see someone do that growing up, how, how, you, you're always thinking the kid's got a, a chance to win. And I gotta tell you, nine out of 10 people would have tapped to the Kimura that um, Dos Anjos put on Anthony. But I've just known Anthony so long, his, his intestinal fortitude and who he is, how he grew up, there's no quit in Anthony Pettis. He may lose, but you'll never see him just straight out quit. It's just not who he is. I was watching, we were talking to Ben yesterday and watching him in training, and it kind of surprised me a little bit. I would have thought that he would be, like in the gym, trying to do more striking. And it said, it's sick. Like, when I see him spar with people, it's like, well, that looks exactly like his fights. Like, he, he comes out and does that. Do you, is that a, a conscious thing for you guys? Do you, do you want to see him just do what he's going to do rather than try to, like, sharpen up the other skills? I mean, he's just so good at what he does. My biggest thing... You know, the older you get, it's harder to teach people certain skills. Just like I'll never get even on his radar with wrestling. I could train every day with him and his coaches, and they'll never get me on that radar. What Ben's really good at is defensive skills. He truly is the willy pep. He knows how to roll with shots. He's a really intelligent guy. Intelligent people know how to win fights the easiest, right? I mean, you know, everyone's like, oh, I want to be fight of the night. No, I want knockout of the night or submission of the night. Because that means the fight ended early. It was easy. You know, that's the whole idea. When I do coach someone, I really focus on finishing fights because you take years off your career when you go the, the full rounds. You got to put the full mileage on the vehicle. That being said, that's something I've really worked on with Ben, finishing fights. And if you look at his fights and his mentality, he is finishing fights. Do you think that, uh, it's, we were talking about his, uh, the way he ended up in 1FC, uh, and like it seems like on one hand it gives him this ability to talk about the UFC from outside, and people kind of look to him now to be that guy. But it also seems like kind of a shame that we don't get to see him against some of those guys in the UFC. I mean, do, you, do you feel like that's... You know, uh, does he need to fight in the UFC to, to prove something about his, his career? No, I don't. I think right now the MMA market's really cool. I mean, there's, there's guys I like seeing in, in Bellator. There's guys I like seeing in 1FC. Uh, there's guys in UFC. I think High Tide's raising all the ships. Everyone's sharing the market. You know, the 1FC does a great job in the Asian market. You know, Bellator's filling, you know, that sec that second-tier group. They, You know, I don't even say second tier, it's just another option for people to fight. I, I really like the matchmaking at Bellator too. They're kind of reminiscent of Strike Force and Pride. They try and put together stylistic fights for the fans. So not not always a ratings fight, but it's a Gotti Ward fight. You know, I mean Gotti Ward is one of the, the most beloved boxing matches and when both of those guys matched up at the time, they weren't in the A level of fighters, but they put on an A level performance. Because at the end of the day, to me, that's what fighting's about. It's creating an entertainment perspective. You know, that's what I look for when I watch a fight Saturday. I had the pleasure, I got to go to the UFC as a spectator. I don't do that too often. And, you know, I had a ball watching, you know, Donald Cerrone. I had a ball watching Travis Brown and Orlowski. I had a ball watching, um, you know, the, the, the tides turn even in both title fights. Is, you know, and that's that's what's important about our sport. Best is is um, important. Well, it's kind of like the problem with Floyd Mayweather. If you don't appreciate the jazz that is Floyd Mayweather, you don't appreciate 
you know, the boxing, most people want to show up for a fight. So, you know, that that's a catch-22 of our sport. But that's the cool thing. You know, you can go to one. You can go to Bellator. You can go to UFC. And I love everybody, man. Dana's awesome. Lorenzo, they're so good to all my guys there. Uh, I got one guy in, in Bellator, and I love Scott. I've known Scott since I was a little kid, you know, through the martial arts community. He's an awesome guy. He promoted me in strike force kickboxing and in K1. Love that guy. And, you know, I go, one FC is really good to Ben, so no complaints. It's just the free market of MMA. <laughs>
but I was not blown away by the shirts. I was a little, it was a, a little unassuming. I, would, I just was expecting, again, I think maybe more difference between maybe a little more personality of the fighters that they were representing. You know, if I see a McGregor and I, I expect, you know, to see something that's going to be different than, say, a Demetrius Johnson. You couldn't have two totally different, even though Demetrius, he stepped it up a little bit, you know, in his, his you know, kind of being a little more sassy, you know, if you will, at Q&As and whatnot. But there, there couldn't be two more totally different personalities than Demetrius Johnson and Conor McGregor. So I would think that the clothing that represents them would be totally different as well. And this was not different. It was very, very similar. But and again, you know, hey, you know, I only saw a fashion show. You know, I mean, I haven't seen, you know, maybe Fight Night under different lights. And watching it, it's going to look, uh, you know, incredible. But, you know, um, so I, I guess I'll reserve my full judgment until after we see it a little bit. Let's see if it grows on me and whatnot. But, um, hey, I, I mean, I think anytime a major organization like Reebok or whatnot gets behind the UFC or MMA, I'm all for it. So I'm going to give them the chance to... Uh, to make it right, if you will, yeah, and uh, and do their thing, and uh, I look forward to see what other little changes because I mean, hey, I, I I got some Reeboks, I got some Nikes, I got all the different type of shoes, I got some Reeboks, so hey, I'll give them a chance to uh, to do to do their thing, and uh, you know, hope for the best. Yeah, I agree. I did like the Champions Kit a lot. I think that looked really sharp. Um, I, these things are going to launch in stores before the week, so maybe I was thinking, uh, I think it launched in Sports Authority July 7th, which is Tuesday of next week. Uh, maybe we could take a little MMA roadshow uh, uh, road trip out to Sports Authority, just kind of see what their, see what their uh, setup looks like, see what kind of merchandise they have on the racks, and, and see uh, maybe kind of what they're offering on that first day. Hey, I think that sounds like a great idea, but I mean, whew, that price break, man, they got to they work something out. Ninety nine bucks for for what, uh, you know, is a t shirt? Who pays for that? I don't even pay that much money to go see a concert that I absolutely love. Favorite artists like that's that's asking a lot, and uh, you know, it certainly didn't take that much money to 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 put into uh, designing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna say. I'm just gonna say. I'm just gonna say. <laughs> uh, all right. Well. Uh, all right. So we've got one more segment of audio to play. We're gonna play the the rest of the Ben Folks and Duke Rufus audio, uh, and, and I hope you enjoyed the first half of that interview. Uh, before we do, we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap things up here and, and let that kind of play out the rest of the show. Um, let me just say, obviously, please, if you can, follow us on Twitter uh, at the MMA Roadshow. Same thing on Instagram, the MMA Roadshow. Right now you'll get to see a lot of pictures of me on vacation. Uh, but, it, but hey, that's what we're up to, and I figured it'd be okay to, to share that with you guys. But uh, we're, we're going to have an insanely busy week next week. It's, it's International Fight Week in Las Vegas. We'll both be home. Um, of course, UFC 189. Uh, the Ultimate Fighter 21 finale is on Sunday as well. And Victa SC 13 is on Thursday night, yes. which, which Cole Coffee will actually be a part of that uh, production. I'll be there covering it as media, but uh, Cole Coffee will actually be working with the organization as well. Um, I can tell you that on Thursday night, we haven't exactly figured out the details of where we're going to record uh, the episode next week. But what I can tell you is that when we sit down to record uh, next week's episode, in Las Vegas, we will have attended a press conference and we mm -hmm. have been offered 30 individual interviews over the course of two different sessions. And that's in addition to the press conference. And we will have also seen Invicta SC 13. All that is happening on one single day on Thursday, July 9th. That it's is a lot of insane. It's a lot of stuff because, you know, especially with the Invicta, you know, there's going to be post-fight interviews. There's going to be post-fight pressers. So if you guys aren't fans of Invicta FC at this point, uh, you really should be. I mean, uh, a lot of people want to consider them like a feeder organization to the UFC. And they, they kind of have been, you know, but I think that's just from the, the sheer fact that the UFC is the biggest platform right now. And a lot of the women want to go in there now that they accept the women. But the Invicta does what they do so absolutely well. It's a great organization. The women that fight in that thing fight just as hard and work just as hard as anybody else. Every time I've went and seen, and I've seen multiple events as a fan, I absolutely fucking love it. It's a great, great time. If you're here in Vegas for fight week and other things, you need to get tickets. Go to that. Go see it. You know, Watch it streaming on Fight Pass, all that good stuff. 
Uh, but yeah, that night's gonna be fucking balls crazy because yeah, I mean, I know I'm gonna be doing fight probably behind the scenes post fight interviews with that, and then we're gonna shoot the post presser, which Mr. John Morgan will be there, and hopefully you can uh, continue your run as getting of getting uh, first questions at post fight press uh, conferences, and uh, and then yeah, then we'll find a place to uh, to kick this off, and then if we get it all worked out as a nice treat, uh, hopefully we'll get the Periscope thing. Uh, you know, we try to stay up to date, and a lot of people have been hitting us up, and I know hitting John up about trying to do the Periscope thing. And, uh, you know, I'm going to take inspiration from the Suicide Girls Periscope that I've been watching recently. <laughs> oh, please don't. And please don't. <laughs> I was thinking we could do this in a hot tub somewhere or something. Like, I've seen – they were actually in a pool, and the other day I saw, like, the, the, the them working on a dance routine, so maybe we can work that in or something. <laughs> but uh, no, in all seriousness, you know, we try to stay abreast of what you guys ask of us abreast. and what you guys <laughs> hope. And uh, uh, I think Periscope would be kind of neat, you know, but again, it'd be raw and gritty because, you know, this is not a pretty show and this is not whatever. This is this is real. So, I mean, I think if, if you guys are into it, um, I created a Periscope account for the MMA Roadshow. Uh, follow it. And if we uh, get it going on, hopefully um, next Thursday will be the first time that we actually you know, just say fuck it and throw it live and, uh, you know, and go from there. And uh, before we get to this next Duke Rufus, I want to say, you know, maybe we'll start a Kickstarter fund for our uh, alcohol treatment since it's been brought to our attention that maybe <laughs> we drank too much. So uh, is it a GoFundMe or is it a Kickstarter? What 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 do we start? Or I mean, who knows? Hey, in all fairness, guys, it's all in fun. We do this because we love this, and uh, but we welcome your we welcome your feedback, whether it be good or bad. We love you all, and it's all fun, man. And uh, thank you for listening. Absolutely, man. As as Cold Coffee said, uh, listen, uh, the MMA Roadshow. You know, obviously you can download us from there. Uh, obviously you can subscribe on iTunes as well. We appreciate the reviews. There's some other much more uh, glowing reviews, which I'll read next time. But uh, this one, <laughs> this one was pointed out to me on Twitter, and I had to get to it. But uh, we'll have to get to some of these other better ones at a later date. But hey, listen, enough is enough. It's uh, it's time for me to go enjoy the rest of my vacation. This beautiful 70 degree weather. We'll have to get back to the uh, Sin City Desert that you are in. Uh, I definitely look forward to it though because International Fight Week is going to be a lot of fun. So speaking of speaking of, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Nope, speaking ahead. of uh, International Fight Week, if you guys are in town because you know we want to be as as accommodating and and as there for you as we can. If you are in town for International Fight Week, we're going to be out and about when we finally find our destination that we're going to do the taping of the road show. If we do and we and you are here in town, let us know. If we tweet out and say where we're going to be, we would love to have you guys Absolutely. have some drinks with us. Be there. Watch it. I can't guarantee you're going to get on the show. Maybe if I turn this Periscope thing around, you'll see yourselves on on whatever. But we would love to have you guys be there and uh, have drinks with us. As long as you don't mind if we get awkward at times and put headphones on and, and talks amongst ourselves. Uh, we would love to have you guys. So, hey, if you're here for International Fight Week, we would love to have a couple beers with you guys and uh, have you there while we tape the show. Completely agree. I think there's going to be, you know, the MMA Junkie Gathering is going to be going on. I think there's going to be about eight or nine junkies uh, at Invicta. So maybe uh, we can snag them afterwards and start that as a live audience. And then uh, if we can get a few more people, we'll, we'll definitely have some fun. So uh, looking forward to that. So now uh, let, let me just say, of course, thanks for listening. Uh, it means a lot. Uh, it really does. And uh, we're going to play this thing out with the rest of this uh, wonderful interview. Ben Folks uh, sat down, of course, with Duke Rufus. Cold Coffee was there to tape everything. And uh, since I'm on vacation, we figured I'd let you guys listen to this. Uh, in this in this last half of the interview, uh, <laughs> he really gives a lot of updates on the rest of the team, including, of course, CM Punk, who will be in town CM for Punk. International Fight Week. He will be there for International Fight Week. Uh, talks about a lot, lot more. Uh, Cold Coffee jumps in there with some questions and gets some great responses on, you know, what it takes to make a quality training camp, how fighters should choose a training camp, how uh, training camps, what they should offer fighters. So uh, a lot of good information here. Um, hopefully you guys have enjoyed it. Um, again, taking vacation this week, but still wanted to keep the, uh, the, the shows coming, and I hope you enjoyed the content. And uh, as Cold Coffee said earlier, more than anything, just thanks for listening. <laughs> CM Punk thing, how's that going? Really good. I mean, he has got this attitude and a drive. What made him successful in the world of professional wrestling is going to make him do good. 
in MMA. And, and I'm being a realist. I'm not saying he's going to be a champ, but you know what? He's going to make the role we were just talking about, entertainment. He's going to be a fighter that people want to watch. One, he brings a crowd. But secondly, just like Brock Lesnar, he is going to stack up. Remember, everyone thought Brock wasn't going to do anything. And he won the heavyweight title of the world uh, with a handful of fights. You know, that being said, Punk is in a tougher division. And, you know, he doesn't have the amateur wrestling skill or, or just the, the pure ferocity of Brock. But that being said, he, he's going to, you know, turn some heads. You know, he's, he's a natural fighter. And I, sound, I think that sounds cliche, possibly, but he has that I'm not going to run from the fire mentality. I know a lot of guys are good at certain skills, and they come in, and you mix the skills together, and they fall apart. You know, I mean, it's uh, you could be the greatest striker in the world, but uh, who said it? I think uh, Henzo Gracie. You know, you can be the king of the jungle, but if you go in the water and swim with the sharks on the ground, you're nobody. And, and you know, that that's a cool thing about MMA. If you're comfortable everywhere, you, you can be better than someone who's only comfortable in one spot. But no, he's he's a good friend, too. I've known Phil now two years. So I'm, I met him through Chael's son, and I watched Ben's fight with... Uh, Amasu, when we were in Chicago for Anthony Cerrone fight, we hit it off. I knew it for a long time. I've, I've kind of sat on it. I knew he was coming here to train with us. It was just, you know, I didn't want to talk about it or anything. You know, it's one, it's the vicinity, but two, he does like our mentality here a lot. When do you think he'll be ready to fight? I want to say a year. A year from now? Um, yeah, possibly. Nine months to a year. I mean, my big thing, I want him to... You know, he's got one shot, all eyes are on him. I want him, one, to represent himself. Have, you know, this is a big thing for his life. Who who he is, this is, he's very passionate about this. This is something he knows he got to jump the front of the line and he wants to be ready to succeed. But two, I love the sport of mixed martial arts, combat sports, all of them. What I don't want to do is try and give people mockery. I want to make sure that he's ready. So, I mean, if I got to tell the bosses at UFC that, hey, give me more time, please, I'm going to do that because, I mean, uh, no wine's made before his time. Cool thing is, I mean, he's here with everybody and we all love the guy. So we all take him under our wing and, uh, you know, really help him out. He's the best guy to have on our team, honestly. He's just a great guy. He contributes and he mops the mat every day at the end of training. He's very humble, you know. He He's really into the philosophy of uh, the Japanese style with wrestling. They're called the young boys, so the new guys in Japan, almost like a sumo house, have to do all the chores. So here you see uh, world wrestling, world champion at the end of practice. He mops every day. That's just his personality. I don't tell him to mop. That's him it's it's kind of cool he's he's um you know he's he's on a serious journey you know some people and it's not even about money for him he has money he's very he's made his money for him it's, it's a dream it's a passion and that's what i respect about him we were talking yesterday a little bit to, to chico seeing him back in the gym and i remember talking to both of you guys before about the, the split and everything uh, how are the the men defenses there? oh better than ever my only problem with chico he's a great guy Great guy. I love him. We've never had a problem relationship-wise. My thing is getting him to realize his potential. And that's what I want to see him do. That's my job because I remember when Chico started from nothing. Anthony brought him in from the streets. You know, Chico had the kind of a tough south side of Milwaukee gang-related stuff. He's been through a lot of stuff. And uh, I've seen him mature so much in the last year dedicate himself and see there's nothing better than seeing people reach their potential there's nothing worse that's more sad in life is seeing wasted talent or wasted potential and uh, I'm excited I think he's gonna do great with Henry Cejudo he's an incredible fighter but Chico has found his mark especially showed in his last fight with a, a, a grizzly veteran like Brad Pickett who's awesome I mean even the way Chico's thinking and you know, he's really believed in himself. Sometimes, you know, you come from nothing and you, you don't necessarily value yourself enough. I think he didn't value and have confidence enough in himself to, oh, I'm just doing this, it's an easy paycheck. Now he's thinking career-minded, title-minded, and he never said those words before to me. 
Now he's thinking about providing for his family. Let's get a few more wins. I want to buy a house for my family. Again, getting back to knowing your why. One of my gurus came here to speak to all the fighters, uh, Eric Thomas. They call him the hip hop preacher. And when he spoke to all the fighters, he said uh, that the key to success is finding your why. And uh, Chico's found his why. So now he's got his how, his what, his when, his where, and why. And that's, see, he's looking great. Because I love the kid. He's awesome. I mean, you want to talk about a great guy. He's a great guy. I just wanted to put him on the path of success. And I'm so proud. Now I, it's great. I don't, there's no beef at all because he's doing it for himself. Because that's really what fighting is. The most successful people in this industry are self-starters. And he's molded himself into a self-starter. And that's what I'm proud of. But we talked before when I think the, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel thing came out and some of the, the ex-teammates and stuff were, were, were criticizing you. How do you feel like uh, the, the gym has bounced back from that since then? And it's never really affected us. I mean, that's the thing, you know, unfortunately that, that's just life and, you know, you're going to always have people who like us, dislike us, people love the Green Bay Packers or they hate the Green Bay Packers. You know, the, know what the worst thing is to be? Who are the Green Bay Packers? And I mean, at least, you know, we have people who are very passionate about what we do. We have people that aren't so passionate. Me, I don't hold it personally against any of those guys. Um, you know, they're going to get my age someday and they're going to grow up and see things in a different light. And that's just with age and time. So I'm not like, um, you know, disdainful towards them. You know, they got to live with what they said and what they do. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm not upset at them. They'll, they'll figure it out once they get a little older, you know? I mean, it's prize fighting. It's not the easiest business in the world. I mean, we were training yesterday and just... You know, two really good fighters are training, and a guy shoots in and tweaks an ankle. A little accident happens. It, it's that's the tough thing, and they're going at a very controlled pace. But at the end of the day, that's me. If you don't dis if you dislike me, it's because I'm trying to make you be the best you. If you're comfortable not being the best you, then you probably don't want to train with me. You know, you got to look at how I grew up. My dad trained ten world champions in his own family. And another world champion on top of that. I mean, I've already trained champ champions in Muay Thai, K1, um, my brother in boxing, amateur champions, MMA. Like, that's the thing. I'm trying to teach these kids. One thing I know is your time is short. You only have a window of opportunity. If you're not dedicated to make it in mixed martial arts, it, it's not a cool job just to be average yet, honestly. You know, even in the UFC, you're either climbing or you're falling. You know, that's it. It's one or the other, and it is a tough industry. And I'm trying to help people realize that so they don't miss out on opportunities. Well, lastly, I mean, you mentioned the, the injuries thing, and uh, we were talking a little bit about Anthony hurting his arm. It seems like right now there's like a focus on the gyms. Like you hear Dan White talking about all these guys who tra their training practices, and it seems like, like some of the coaches I've talked to feel like it's all reflecting on them like when guys get hurt I mean how, how do you what do you do about that man I mean we're really I mean we only spar live not 100% but you know decent you know 70% once a week that's on Monday when they come in fresh there's no no everyone should be fully rested from the weekend so that, that that's how we set ours up we do ours on Monday so everyone had the weekend to rest I want the freshest athlete in here possible when we do any live sparring now. But the thing is, it's not striking that's hurting us. In our gym, it's the wrestling accidents. You know, it, it's hard. Wrestling while you're doing MMA is a very chaotic sport. You know, and, and even that, um, if the guys didn't grow up wrestling, they don't know how to fall as good as the other guys. I mean, there's a lot of little things that happen. You're defending a punch, all of a sudden you get taken down. If I'm only defending takedowns, I know. I have to worry about a takedown. So you land in a lot more precarious situations while you're doing MMA. You know, what, what we love about our sport, you know, is also the, the, the chaotic. That's why I love MMA. It's a fun, chaotic fight to watch. But the chaos causes the injuries, you know. But here's the thing. In boxing, the coolest thing about boxing, you wear your headgear, the, the bigger guys they wear the bar helmet. You got your foul cup. I mean, you're only hitting with your hands. You're not going to get your arms broken from getting punched. And the, the worst thing is brain damage, you know. If you have a boxing perspective, you're like, well, why are these guys getting hurt? 
Thing is, in order to get in shape at wrestling, there's only one way you can do it. Live wrestle. How, that's that's the thing. Look at and look at guys who are live wrestling still have a hard time with the guys who have a wrestling background. How are you supposed to fight all these wrestlers if you don't actually wrestle? And that that's the biggest problem here. We don't uh, Anthony tweaked his knee before the Aldo fight doing jiu-jitsu. Again, you're on sweaty mats, weird positions. The safest discipline that we train here is striking. That's the least amount of you know injuries that we see with our team. Other teams possibly different, you know, but I, I really work on striking safety, but you know, again, the chaotic positions of wrestling. Maybe one question I just had that you, what was neat to hear is this camaraderie and this sort of family that builds up with these fighters that you get. And then maybe it's a cliche question, but I think a lot of these young athletes, as they're working their way up, try to find a place like, where's the right place for me? Where's the right gym? If you had to speak to somebody that is maybe just starting and trying to find that mentor, trying to find a place that's going to nurture them, what are the kind of things that they could look for, the signs sure. of a good gym to go to? And if you could just kind of... Cool. Turn. Well, I think the key to, you know, finding your gym or academy to train at, one, do they reinvest money into the equipment and coaches? You know what I mean? That, to me, that's that's a number one. It's prize fighting. Everyone's trying to turn a profit, right? So are you reinvesting? That's the biggest thing for me. Even living in third world Thailand, the one thing I, that I enjoyed about that, we would sleep on, on bamboo mats, but there would be a world-class ring, world-class Thai pads, former champions training us. And uh, we live at almost, you know, third world conditions, but the equipment was the best. So I think, one, finding a good, safe environment, great coaching staff. Two, what, find people that have your mindset, you know. Um, it, me, I'm not the mindset for everyone, but neither is Greg Jackson. Neither is, say, Rafael Cordero. Neither is, you know, Javier Mendez. These are just, Ray Longo. These are all my personal friends that I have due respect for each each school has its own culture and find the culture that works for you. You know, that's the thing. I don't take it personally if you're not into our culture. Find the culture that works. I mean, and the biggest thing, like I think the neat thing at our academy, I don't have any heavyweights here. We used to have a few, but we really were always limited with training partners. So we don't have a lot of heavyweights. But what we're, our specialty right now is 125 to 170. We have tons of guys in between that weight and it makes it really easy because we can split our team almost like the ultimate fighter into you know the small 45s can go here and the bigger 45s can go we don't, you know kind of the early seasons the ultimate fighter we can do a, a split of sparring and groups and things of that nature and it just happenstance here at our team you know it was it was uh you know by accident we have those weights that being said find people that have experience find people that can give you a well-rounded environment. You know, that's the thing. You know, even though we're uh, a kickboxing academy, you know, we work a lot of wrestling, a lot of jiu-jitsu. I surround myself with the right assets to make us well-rounded. Me, W's are W's. If it's from a takedown, if it's from a submission, or it's from outboxing someone, I don't care. You know, that's the biggest thing. And the other thing too is, find. You know, I know it's hard if you're the guy who's never produced someone. But if you're looking to fast track your career, go right away to the House of Champions. That's what you're going to do the best. You know, I, that's that's what I did when I went to Thailand. I went to one of the best camps ever in, in Sitiatong. I tried a gym for two days before that, and it was a terrible experience. I won't say the gym in Bangkok, terrible. I go to Sitiatong, and I had an incredible experience. Same thing, uh, you know, we want to find people that can fast track your career. Because you know what? My biggest advice to every athlete, tick tock, tick tock, the clock is ticking. You only have so many years as a youthful person, man or woman, in the sport that you can, you know, gain success. And it seems like for the men, their arc is lower, and the women, luckily, because of the sport, they, they don't have the issues that men do as they get in their 30s where the women have, I think, a little bit more longevity at this point. That being said, let's find a place that you're home. And two, like uh, our gym, we don't have a lot of people come from way out. They come from the Midwest. They drive home a lot. A lot of the guys went home on the holiday weekend. Stay connected to your family. Stay connected to 
the people back home. Because if you come out here and you isolate yourself, that was a tough thing when I used to go to Thailand. I mean, I would get home from Thailand and I didn't want to hear Thai. I didn't want to eat Thai food because that's all we ate. And I love the Thai culture, but you got to have what you are. You know, if you need, you know, this is what you are. Uh, I have one fighter, she visits me from California, and she'll never visit me anymore in the winter. You know, she surfs every day, and, you know, find, you know, if it's warm weather, if it's you're from the Midwest, or, you know, it, find, because if you're not happy as a person, you won't be happy as a fighter. They say, yeah, you got to struggle. Yeah, struggling's all part of this, but when you get out of the gym and you're not, happy outside the gym there's no payoff to take the struggle you know what I mean there there's two payoffs there's hopefully the success of an athlete but if, if your gym if you're outside the gym life is miserable you're not gonna survive the grind of being a professional athlete so that's you know a lot of the guys do go home and you know, I have a lot of guys from Iowa who will do long weekends you know just to see family stay connected you know I mean I, I think uh, you know, it takes a lot of moral and emotional support in this sport. You know, the injuries, the setbacks, you know what I mean? So that's my biggest thing. You find a place to, and that also too, I mean, the cost of doing business. I think our biggest asset, it's cheap to live here in Milwaukee and cheaper than some places. So find a place that, you know, isn't the most expensive to live. I, I understand Albuquerque is pretty affordable and that's a good situation, but yeah, that's a hard thing. I mean, unfortunately, we have this crazy thing called money that we have to have to survive, love it or not. So try and find the, the best financial situation. And as well, I mean, if you have a type of fighter that you like to fight and that Jim's produced it, I mean, do it. I mean, look, look at Novo and Iam. They produce a type of fighter. Shootbox did back in the day. Militich did back in the day and even AKA has a brand that they're producing these athletes and so try and find what you want to become you know and, and go and go become that there because you know sometimes the biggest disconnect you can have with someone is well I want to be this type of fighter you know yes and no I mean we're open somewhat but you know you look at the type of fighter we're producing that's really kind of the brand we produce if that makes sense. No, that was a great answer. And I, I think the only opposite side of that would be is um, what sort of fighter or what sort of person are you, is, is this gym really appreciative when they come into the door? Are you guys looking for a guy that's willing to wants to be good at this, this, this? Like, what do you look for oh, for an athlete that's cool. going to come to this gym? Well, I, what I look for in an athlete is, um, you know, to me, it's not always about natural ability. It's about desire, work ethic, but first and foremost, attitude. You know, it, I'm, I don't want to fight you to make you successful. You know, I want to nurture you, help you. And there's nothing worse than seeing people who give their attitude to coaches, you know. I wish I could give all my coaches raises here, but we don't have it in the finances. You know, we live, we all live pretty humbly. The nicest thing, the nicest thing in my life is our gym, you know. We all love the sport and we're all sacrificing. So I, I, I like very respectful and fun people who, you know, we're trying to help them, not hurt them. You know, the other thing too is again being well-rounded that's the cool thing about MMA find as many ways to win the fight you know I've never been like oh darn Anthony Pettis won by submission no that's even easier than striking someone the most dangerous part of a fight is the striking so if you can win the easiest way of the fight a submission yes please so I, I'm all about it um, recently a lot of our fighters have been winning either on top on their mat or by submission. And I love it. I think Ben Askren, I think Daniel Vanderlei for instilling that in the athletes. I mean, yeah, striking, that's that's our thing. But thing is, if we're both good at striking and I'm better at jiu-jitsu, why not win? And or like what Anthony did against um, a guy like Gilbert Melendez was in the heat of the battle and he found that opportunity and he surprised attacked him. You know, and, and that's the key. I mean, my whole goal is to make these guys world-class kickboxers, the best wrestlers they can be in black belts and jiu-jitsu. Because when they're done with their career, that's another thing I'm really instilling is I'm trying to help these guys. If they want to go into the industry 
and I'd love to say it was my original idea, my friend Ricardo Labario. He's done that incredible with all of his former fighters. They all rock their ATTs and they really do a good job of having a life after fighting. And that's a big martial arts focus I want here with the guys that I'm working with. I want them to be able to, if things don't go the best with their career, to have the best possible situation so that uh, there's a life after fighting and you know they're learning a lot of the, the martial arts skills and business skills so they can have a life after fighting. So yeah, I'm, I'm really into people who want to learn, change. I learn and change every day. If that were the case, I'd still have a karate gi on. I would still wear long pants and PK kickboxing. I'd still be doing Muay Thai, K1, MMA. And I just earned my purple belt in uh, Jiu Jitsu. So, yeah, so I know I love it. And it, you know, it, I, it, it, the open mind is the most dangerous mind. The closed mind is, you know, when you know someone has a closed mind, they're easy to uh, beat, in my humble opinion. Great, awesome. great answer. Couldn't ask for more than that. Thanks. <laughs>